The United States Open Trophy stands emblematic of this, the most prestigious of all golf tournaments. The heritage and traditions of the United States Open are reflected by the quality of the past winners. Men such as the great Walter Hagen, Gene Sarazen, Byron Nelson, four-time winner Ben Hogan, and Arnold Palmer have been the recipients of this trophy. In the 1970s, four of the great names of golf have won the United States Open. 1970, Tony Jacklin. 1971, Lee Trevino. 1972, Jack Nicklaus. And last year, Johnny Miller shooting a great round of 63 at Oak Mountain, the final round. At this point of the fourth round, this 24-year-old native of Kansas City, a graduate of Stanford University, Tom Watson, is in the lead. This is the sixth tee. The hole, an amazingly short par four, 324 yards, but it has its problems. In back of the green, there's a creek that doesn't too often come into play, but if you go over, you hit a sloping bank, and it could happen. Tommy Watson and Hale Irwin playing together and tied for the lead in the U.S. Open Championship. Hale Irwin with a good one. That's a fine shot. Just a little pitch to the green from there, remember. And now Tom Watson, at age 24, trying to become one of the youngest men ever to win the U.S. Open. The youngest was Johnny McDermott, and believe it or not, he was only 19 years, 10 months, and I think four or five days. 24 is still pretty young for this championship for a young man who has never won a title on the tour of any kind. It's his third year out there. Well, the gallery likes that one, don't they? Okay, smack in the middle of the fairway. Couldn't be better. So Watson and Irwin are both safely out in the fairway on the short par for the sixth hole. Again, the standings. Irwin and Watson tied. Arnold Palmer has bogeyed this sixth hole just a moment ago before them. And he's tied with Bert and Yancey. You see Jimmy Colbert is there, then Player, Bezler, and Graham. Now back up the course again to 18 and Chris Schenkel. All right, Jim, and with me is a man that was an assistant professional here at Wingfoot. Knows this course, has probably played more rounds on it than anyone in attendance here today. Our pal David Marr. And David, uh, this course is getting to him now. Well, it really is. I had no idea that Wingfoot would play so hard. And uh, it definitely, uh, with the addition of some new tees and uh, you let the rough grow, it has really become a monster this week, Chris. And, of course, it's overcast. We've had some... Uh, not very good weather reports, and we hope they're wrong. Well, it rained a lot this morning, and for a while it was in doubt if it kept up as to whether they could uh, continue with the round. I think, though, we're going to be a little bit lucky and, and be able to finish it, though when you have a lot of rain like that, it makes the rough a lot tougher to play out of, and it's been tough enough this week already. All right, now there's action at the seventh hole, and a man who is a member here is going to report Frank Gifford. Frank? Thank you, Chris, and working with me, one of the greats of the golfing world, former U.S. Open champion, British Open champion, Tony Jacklin. And you're looking at the par three, 166-yard, seventh hole. On the tee will be Arnold Palmer. Palmer, who just bogeyed the sixth hole. He bogeyed the second hole. He's two over for the day. And first, we're going to take a look at Jim Colbert. Jim Colbert began the day at eight over par. Picked up bogeys on three and four. Got a birdie at five, now he's nine over par, but still in contention, considering, Tony, the things that we've seen happen here at Wingfoot this week. Absolutely, Frank, I couldn't agree more. These bunkers are getting uh, more and more troublesome. We've uh, known of a lot of players today take more than one to get out of them. bunkers. That's Jim Colbert's ball just on the front edge of the green. All right, and you see the flag gets guarded uh, to the golfer's right by that bunker, and that was the bunker which cost Johnny Miller a quadruple seven on this hole on Friday. Now here he is, Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer began the day at six over par, making a hard drive for his second U.S. Open title. Palmer bogeyed the second hole, and he bogeyed the fourth hole. He is now eight over par. A lot of pressure, wouldn't you say, Tony? You said That's right. Coming back. He needed a good start, really, today. This is about be about a six iron, Frank. He's short again. He's been short here three straight days now. But he shouldn't have any trouble at least making a par from there. All right, over to the sixth fairway, and we'll pick up Jim McKay there. Right, Frank, one hole behind Palmer, remember. Here is Hale Irwin at age 29, looking for his first major championship. He's been on the tour since 1968. In that time, he's won only two titles. Interestingly enough, the same one both times, the Heritage Classic. Let's see where this goes. Lovely shot. Fine shot. Excellent throw on the ball, and uh, he's got that putt for a birdie. Certainly could be made, and the, and the greens are playing slower today. 
than on previous days. How much slower do you think they might be out there, David, from what you've observed? Well, I think to get back to the greens there a little bit, Jim, uh, they, they may be a little slower. They just went from very, very fast to very fast, I think. They, they drain very well, and uh, they're <laughs> okay. not anything like what we're used to. Here's Tommy Watson. Remember, seeking his first victory as a professional on this very short 324-yard right. hole. Up there, but this one is not going to come back. Back again on the seventh green, Jim Colbert. He's on your right. Arnold Palmer's on your left. And Tony Jacklin, you mentioned earlier as you watched the early going here that maybe the golfers are getting uh, thinking ahead of themselves just a bit. Well, I think that'll be a big problem for uh, uh, Tom Watson and Hank Irwin. Uh, being younger players, I think Arnold uh, knows these type of pressures, but I remember very well when I won, the greatest difficulty I had, and I was in front most of the way, and considerably in front uh, toward the end, but you, you know, it's very easy to let your mind wander ahead and start seeing that trophy being presented to you and shaking hands and saying thank you very much, and this is the great thing that these fellows have got to try and avoid today, it's a question of concentration and keeping their minds in the present. All right, we're looking at Tommy Watson. He's on the sixth hole. Watson will be going for a birdie. Remember, he's tied for the lead, but this is Jimmy Colbert now on your right. Colbert also going for a birdie on seven. Jim Colbert, who plays so well in the big tournaments. On its way. And you see, even after the rain this morning, the speed of the green at seven, and Colbert will have quite a putt to return for his par at seven. Now, on the left is young Tommy Watson. Tommy Watson with a round of 69 yesterday, showing no inclination that he might crack into the pressure. Oh, oh, yeah! And obviously, Watson has picked up a lot of his fans here at Wingfoot. And I have this tap in for his par to remain at Plus five, tied with Hale Irwin. Now on the right, Arnold Palmer. Hoping to make a charge. He's lost two shots to par through six holes. Looking to get a close. And again, that gallery that Tony, we've heard so often. How inhibiting is that gallery, Tony, to a player playing with Arnold Palmer? Well, of course, it's very difficult, Frank. You know, you just get the feeling occasionally out there that the whole world's pulling for Arnold Palmer and you're there to make the number up. Uh, but I'm sure uh, Jim Colbert's experienced that before. He's played with Arnold before, and uh, here we're back with Hale Herwin now on the sixth hole. All right, going for a birdie. Pick it up, Jimmy. Yeah, as we said before, this is for the birdie, and it's uh, looks like about a seven- or eight-foot putt. Watching it with Frank Gifford and me is Tony Jacklin. That's the other voice you're hearing. He did not step away for us because we're actually about 500 yards away from him. <laughs> he may just want to look it over again. Tony Jacklin, of course, one of only four foreigners ever to have won this championship. The others being Harry Varden, Ted Ray, and Gary Player. A very select company and a worthy member is Tony. This would give Hale Irwin the lead in the championship. He and Tommy Watson, remember, are tied at plus five. Arnold Palmer and Bert Yancey are plus eight, three shots behind them. Nope, nope, no way. He nearly took a big break there, Tony. But it's a par for Hale Irwin. He remains in a tie for the lead. Okay, Frank. Okay, and Hale Irwin walks off the green. He'll walk over to the tee at seven, where right at this moment, Arnold Palmer is looking over this putt for his par. Palmer, three shots off the lead, playing tremendous golf here. Arnold Palmer with rounds of 73, 70, and 73. Obviously, the gallery's choice. A man who really has made golf in this country. If there is such a man, you're looking at him. And he gets his three, and a roar goes up from the crowd. Arnold Palmer, what charisma this man has. We'll be back in Wingfoot, Memoranac, New York, after this. On the tee at the par three, seventh hole here at Wingfoot, Hale Irwin and Tom Watson locked at five over par and a tie for the lead. Behind them is Arnold Palmer, eight over par, Bert Yancey is eight over par, and Jimmy Colbert, nine over par. But you're looking at Hale Irwin, who is a steady player. And again, Tony Jacklin talking with you is uh, like going through a textbook on golf. And 
What you said about concentration, I think, is so important, particularly on a course like this. When you won at Hazeltine in, in 1970, you won by seven shots. But, all right, well, let's go over to Henry Longhurst, first at eight. Well, now, he has a very, very fine, powerful hole. Let's watch Palmer, first of all. He's got a feed there with some big trees. Yeah. And that's right in the middle. Uh, that's a very fine tee shot. We'll go back to Frank now. And Hale Irwin, again on the tee. Again, the concentration thought, Tony. Yeah, I couldn't stress that enough, really. To stay in the present and think about what you're doing all the time. Not let your mind stray ahead, Frank. That's the great thing. And this type of course, that one stray shot can grab, you can make a double bogey so easily. And this is what's been happening all week, as we've seen. So concentration is of the utmost importance. Balls in the air. Halo wins ball on the sub. And he's missed the green on the left in the left trap, I think, or in the, in the bunker. He is in the bunker on the left-hand side of the seventh so He'll have difficulty there making his par. All right, and the other member of that twosome is Tom Watson. And Halo Irwin and Tom Watson are tied here on the final round of the U.S. Open at Wingfoot. And I would think maybe right now, Tony, that Tom Watson's thinking, wow, I can grab a shot on him right here. Well, this is it, you know, but that's, that again is thinking ahead, you know, so Tom Watson wants to be just, he's hitting this five or six iron here, and all he wants to be thinking out is the method in his swing and just putting a real good swing on it, which is beautiful. 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 Well, it's perfect. He's in really good order, and he's set himself up for a good chance of a birdie anyway. Right in the middle of the green is Tom Watson. There you see the standings. Hale Irwin at five over Tom Watson. Let's go now over to Jim McKay. Now back live, Jack Nicholas on the sixth tee. Excuse me, sixteenth hole. Just below us here. Plus fourteen for the championship. Playing partner today is Bruce Crampton. There's Jack, and now back to Frank Gifford. And a very important shot by Hale Irwin. Absolutely. We haven't seen Hale hit very many bad shots this week. He's had trouble with his putting yesterday, but that's one of the very few bad shots we've seen him hit here. Let's see how he handles this. These greens again are very fast. The ball's going to roll considerably, even all the rain we had in the night. Seven, eight feet from the hole, nine feet maybe. And he'll need that putt, providing we do not see young Tommy Watson, who now comes into the view on your right. He'll earn would need that putt for a par, providing Tommy Watson doesn't get his birdie. Now, he'll have a putt of about 22 to 24 feet, and Tony, he's been one of the steadiest youngsters, considering the pressure that has been on this young man all week long. He's got a really good swing, a really solid sound swing, Frank. Don't forget these two fellows have got a pretty good cushion, really, between them and Arnold Palmer and Bert Yancey. The, here they are. They're eight over. Here's Arnold Palmer now. And we'll let it. Henry Longhurst describe this shot. Here it is, a second shot at the eighth. He set himself up wonderfully with the tee shot. It's a very difficult one. And that's on the receiving end. And there it is, right on the middle of the green for Arnold Palmer. That's a very good one. So now we go back to Frank. And our co-leader Tom Watson doing a little repair work on the green here at seven. <laughs> a youngster from Stanford on the golf team there for three years. Has been playing so consistently, I can recall Byron Nelson early in the year saying this youngster has got one of the fine swings in golf. And the thing, again, Tony, that has impressed me, he has not given in one bit to the pressure that has been applied here. That's right. He's really handling it up to now. The last 48 hours have probably been the longest 48 hours in his life. I'm sure this morning... I I there were a few butterflies? <laughs> I'm, sure there were, I'm sure this morning felt like a lifetime, but... For a birdie. Oh. And trickling by. He'll have uh, two and a half to three feet coming back. Dave Moore was saying yesterday that just when you think the ball stopped, it just rolls that other foot and a half or two feet or so, and it makes it that, that very difficult three, four foot length. These are the really ones. 
these are the ones that are, as pros I can really all the viewers watching the amateur golfers these are the ones that, that we feel are the most difficult certainly those three to four footers the gallery tend to walk away you know giving you those but uh, they're by no means in I can assure you of that unfortunately you can't walk away <laughs> that's right you could extend that's, that's the rent <laughs> that's right you could extend and uh, figure some way out of getting the thing in all right now Hale Irwin he put his tee shot here at the 166 yard par three into the bunker on the left Blasted out of the wet sand to about, well, so call it eight or nine feet. But this for his par three to remain in a tie with Tom Watson at five over. Great putt. Hale Irwin. Super putt. And he was not putting well yesterday, Tony, and he's got it together now. That was super. That is the type of thing, Frank, that really does your ego good. You know, great things. That, that. That'll do uh, Hale a lot of good now. He's going to go into the eighth hole, and he's really going to feel that, uh, you know, things are going to roll, start rolling for him. And it's uh, Yeah, he had, uh, what, four or three-putt greens yesterday, so right. it's coming around. Now, this is Tommy Watson for his par, now to remain tied with Hale Irwin, which he does. So we have our co-leaders again, Hale Irwin and Tom Watson. They are five over par. They walk over to the very troublesome eighth hole, Henry Longhurst. Now we come to this eighth hole. It's 442 yards long, but the great point about it is that you've got to fade your drive round some very high trees on the right. And if you go straight to miss them, you're almost certain to go in the other side and uh, get in the rough, which everybody agrees is at least half a stroke, and I should think perhaps three quarters of a stroke if you get in it. Uh, this is the eighth hole where we're going to see them drive in a minute, but up ahead of them is the great man. Here he is. He's a uh, only three behind, well, one hole can change that, as we all know. And the last man you want breathing down your neck if you're two young men tied. So the lead in the open is Arnold Palmer, at least so I should say, unless it was Nicholas. But uh, strangely, he's not, well, he's hardly with it at all in this championship, and I think he's 14 over Jack Nicholas at the moment. So we shan't be seeing much of him. So we now go back to the tee. This is the eighth. And Hale Irwin after that really splendid pattern and get out there. Now, that's in the fairway. That's all you want at this hole. And back on the green, Palmer. We don't need to show you the picture there. You can hear what happened. Now back to the tee, Tom Watson. Now we're already safely on the fairway. And they're both there together. That's fine. And if Palmer doesn't make some sort of familiar charge, it's going to be almost a match between these two young players, Irwin and Watson. Uh, let's have a look. We don't see very often Tom Watson and Byron to uh, just tell us about him. Okay, now then you notice that Tom has a very good position here. He has a nice flex at the legs, so that enables him to have a real good use of his feet and legs, which is so necessary. Now, as he starts back, he turns his whole body, his hands go nice and high. See, he goes, he's small, so he goes beyond the horizontal position, which is so often necessary for a young player, especially when he's young and supple like this and wants to get a great deal of distance. He's only a short man, and now he makes a great move through the ball, knows what a straight left side, left arm and head down, coming under and through with a real long, fast through. Now we're back on the eighth, and we left him with Palmer putting on the green. Uh, he's finished now, and he missed his putt and lost a stroke. And so down he goes to the fourth, and for the first time, perhaps we've overlooked him a bit, Bert Yancey lies third. And now back on the eighth family, here is Hale Irwin. He and Watson playing together, the last two out. Fancy that one. Let's see where it's gone. 
And it's in the bunker, in the bunker for Halo Wins. Very easy to get in that one on the left there. Tremendously good par four holders. 442 yards. There's so many here at wing foot, just about a quarter of a mile long. Henry? Yes, sir. Uh, it appeared to me, this viral, it appeared to me that the hair was that a little bit too far away from that long iron. And uh, so often when you do that, it causes you to pull it. He made a good swing at it, but being that far away from the ball meant he had to swing around just a little bit. And now, uh, there you are. That's a rehash, as we say, of Palmer's putt, which he missed on this green a minute or two ago. And that is the one that put Palmer one back behind Yancey. Live again on Watson. Chance to go ahead here if he can put his on and Irwin doesn't get down in two from the bunker. And he's in the same one, neck and neck with these two. Both five over, Yancey eight over. If they take a five each here, uh, Yancey will be within two of both of them. And now uh, let's have a look at uh, Yancey. Moving easily down the ninth hole, Bert Yancey started the day at plus eight. He's still there, and even on this round, came on the tour in 1964, he has won seven times, and he has fussed a lot during this tournament, at times appearing a bit angry, not particularly with anything that you could point out, but edgy, and perhaps a little frustrated that he couldn't get the ball to drop where and stop where he wanted it but he's done it well enough to be very much in contention. He's got to go now up this crown on this huge ninth green, and this is almost like Death Valley, David Tamar, where they've got that pin cut on the man. Great effort it was, now if he can just stop it and keep it from going in the sand trap. Because once you get that ball by the hole on the ninth, you've got a very steep drop, and if you've got a lot of roll on it, the confounded thing can go all the way in the trap. There was a very bold try by Bert Yancey on the ninth hole. So he's got work cut out for him to save par there on nine. Meantime, on eight, here's Tom Watson and Henry. Well, now we come back to the eighth, and more and more, this uh, seems to be a match between these two. One goes in the bunker, great chance for the other, and the other goes in the bunker. They're both in the bunker now. This is on the left of the eighth hole. Joint leaders with five over. Just coming along behind is Yancey with eight. So, first of all, out of the bunker is Hale Owen. in the fringe grass. He gets a good hand, but if it had pitched another foot or so, it would have been better. Now, Watson, we go to Keith Jackson. On the ninth green, Bert Yancey, reaching for par, and he got it. That's a pretty touch. Now, let's go back to eight. Keeps Yancey three behind, but it may be only two behind after this. Now back into the bunker. Yeah. Watson, and that's not a good one. He had his head up a bit, I think. And of course, he was right under the face there. A more difficult one than Irwin's. So he's only just on the green. He'll have to settle, I'm sure, for a five here. Just an outside chance now for Hale Irwin to... Uh, Steel one on him. Henry? Byron. Uh, Tom's ball really was a pretty good shot if he'd landed one more foot from where it was. He had just the frog hair and killed the, killed the shot. If he landed just another foot, he would have probably rolled clear to the hole because that's very fast on that side. And of course, Irwin playing such a good shot made a little more pressure on Tom's because he felt that, no doubt, that the way Hale's been putting today, that he had a, quite a good chance to make his four. Now, while he prepares to add a question to the Byron Nelson, supposing Halo in won this tournament, uh, I was looking back at my own mind, how long is it since a man wearing glasses won the Open? Well, I don't know myself. 
Palmer has own contacts. But uh, not when he won the Open, I think. Nope. And, of course, we have time for one more comment that uh, Irwin is fortunate. When we came along here this morning, it didn't occur to me that uh, play would finish at all. It was pouring down, and that is a great disadvantage to anybody who wears gloves, whatever precautions they may take. Well, now, back to the play. This is the eighth hole, both in the bunker on the left, and Tom Watson to putt first, having only just got out. Slide along and slide by. Good try. So it's at the best a five and a bogey for Tom Watson. Oh, well done. So that puts him six over. And Halo will have this one for a four. Keep him five over. It's kind of turned around a little bit on the hole before the seventh hole. It looked as though that Watson might gain a stroke, and uh, he finally had to make a good little putt to save a par to uh, keep even with Hale after Hale had made that real good putt. So this should be some encouragement to Hale now that he has this putt to go one ahead after making two real good bunker shots the last two holes. Well, now he has uh, Hale when this is, has this one to take the lead on his own by staying five over. Oh, around the corner. No change, both six over. It was pursued by Bert Yancey, eight over. Palmer, nine over. And Fesler and Jim Colbert, also nine over. Anybody's championship, anybody who turns up now with one of those sudden rounds of 66 or so uh, could take it all from all of them. And we go back to Keith Jackson. Arnold Palmer, plus eight, then plus nine. But there he is, striding along on the ninth hole, looking at a very difficult golf shot because this hole is playing right at 462 yards today, listed on the card at 466, normally plays as a par five for the regular play here on this great old golf course. And you have to keep the ball in position to hit a long iron in order to reach it in two. And Dave Marr, some comments from you on the pin placement today. I find it terrifying. The pin is cut up behind the crown, up on top. And I suppose with the prospect of rain, the USGA officials had that in mind when they decided to put all the pins in a rather high position so in case they did have to delay play or something, they would drain well and would have a reasonable putting region. So Arnold Palmer. and that's the right place to have it. And my question to the spotters along the ninth, is that his second or his third shot? Looks like third, that was third shot, third looked shot. like a pitch shot. Yes. Yeah, there's no way he could drive that close to the green. I didn't mean to ignore you a minute ago, but <laughs> yeah, I think you pointed out the, the correct thing. You, once they saw what the weather was like, you have to put it just in case you do get a lot of rain where you have a lot of good drainage. Now let's go back to the tee for Hale Irwin. And Tom Watson, both bogeyed eight. They are now plus six. They're just two shots ahead of Bert Yancey, three shots ahead of Palmer. Palmer has a difficult cut to make to save far. The tee shot by Irwin is in fine shape. Well, You'd be a little bit better off if you had it on the other side of the fairway because uh, trying to reach the green from that particular point, you're not going to be able to get the ball close to the pin because you've got traps, about a half an acre of sand looking you right in the face when you try to come into the pin from that direction. Now here's Tom Watson. Par four, and it's playing 462 today, and the wind is not helping you at all on this particular hole. 
took a full rip. He's right smack dab in the middle. On 10, there's action. Here's Chris. This is the 190 yard par three hole. Bert Yancey in brown, hitting his shot. He is eight over, as Henry Longer said, very much in the battle for the United States Open crown. Let's see where his shot went. It's in the right rough. Trouble with a capital T. This is at the 10th hole, the final round of the United States Open. Bert Yancey, eight over, playing with Frank Beard, who is 10 over. We'll return in a moment. You're looking at Hale Irwin, directly from behind him as we move our portable camera out onto the ninth fairway, and he has a wood in his hand. That'll tell you something about the character of this ninth hole. Arnold Palmer missed that par putt on nine to bogey. And Arnold Palmer now drops to 10 over par. Jim Colbert also bogeyed. He drops to 10 over par. Forrest Fesler suddenly jumps into the picture. Forrest is now only 9 over par and very much in the chase. They tie for the lead, shared by this young man, Hale Irwin, and his playing partner, Tom Watson, both at 6 over par. He's probably going with a 4 wood, maybe even a 5. You see that he's trying to cut it a little bit toward the right side of the green. He's way down on the front, left front, golfer's left front, on the putting surface, but he's got a great big crown to come up over. Now here is Tom Watson, and Tommy is going to go with an iron shot. Has to be two iron. Don't believe that he hits one. Tommy's shot is hit well to the right side now. I don't know if it gets too far over there whether or not he can hold a long iron. Depends on the distance of it. It's a fine shot. He gets it down on the right front of the putting surface or left as we see it. And that also is a very difficult putt to get close for par. Just seconds ago, while we were away, Arnold Palmer had this putt to save par on the ninth hole. And the ball skidded off to the left and did not come back as he anticipated it might. And with this moment of frustration, Got a laugh from the crowd and then tapped in for a bogey five. Now here's Chris. All right, from the blimp, this is Wingfoot. Let's go to Jim McKay, who has some detailed information of the United States Golf Association. Everybody watching this telecast knows that the U.S. Open is conducted by the USGA, United States Golf Association. But what exactly is that? Well, it's a great deal more than the handsome gentlemen in the blue blazers walking the fairways of Wingfoot, making rulings for the most glamorous names in the game of golf very hard-working group with an actual building, a headquarters, a place called Golf House in Far Hills, New Jersey. Here it is, an appropriately beautiful building. However, the USGA has a sister organization across the sea, headquartered here in the clubhouse of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club of St. Andrews, Scotland. Now, between them, these two bodies make the rules of golf. They actually run the game all around the world. Here's a meeting, for example, of the USGA Rules Committee in Pine Valley, New Jersey, being chaired on this occasion by Harry Easterly of Richmond, Virginia. In addition to making the rules, however, they run a tremendous number of tournaments. Things like the U.S. Open, the U.S. Amateur, the Public Links Championship, Women's Championship, Juniors and Seniors, the Walker Cup, the Curtis Cup. The USGA, I can assure you, is a very busy group. They're assisted on many occasions by Jack Tuttle. It's very unusual that the pros work with the amateurs in golf. And Joe Dye, of course, one of the great names. Golf is unique, the only game in which amateurs and pros do work together for a uniform code. The same game for everybody, for U.S. Open champion Johnny Miller, and for amateurs with handicaps of 36, thanks to these men and their organizations. And here now at the 190-yard par 3 tenth hole, Bert Yancey's unsuccessful bid to save a par at the tenth hole, so he'll have that putt for his bogey four to drop back to nine over, or three shots off the lead, shared by Tom Watson and Hale Irwin. Speaking of Tom Watson, there he is. Incidentally, uh, Jack Nicholas has quite a round going today. He is two under coming to the final hole. Two under on his round today, however. 13 over for the 72 hole United States Open Championship. I was a little surprised that he didn't play better here. I thought this course would be right around Jack's game, but uh, to since he's out of it now, these two young men seem to 
taking charge. Uh, <laughs> I think the course is taking charge of everybody, but they're playing their own little game for the Open. Jack was a little young when he won, wasn't he, David? He certainly was. Now for the bogey four at the 10th hole. All right, it's a four. A bogey four at the par three, 10th hole. Yancey will move on to the 11th as we rejoin Keith. And we're watching Hale Irwin, who has to come up the face of that pronounced crown which dominates and characterizes this massive ninth green. And coming up over that crown, the ball was, is going to pick up some speed as it works its way down toward the hole. So you must have sufficient pressure on your puck to get it up over the top without letting the crown take too much break on you. And then try not to knock the ball too far by as it gathers momentum going down the other side. Henry Longhurst, you've just started a whole new round of trivia by raising the question when the last time a man wore glasses and won the open. And that is a brilliant cut. I don't know what in the world to say about it. I didn't think it was possible that a man could, could do it, but I guess you have to believe in the law of averages, don't you? Here again is Chris. Okay, former champion. He's won 14 major championships more than anyone. And that includes the man that won here in 1929, Bob Jones, the great Bob Jones. Former Masters champion as well, Jack Nicklaus. This is his third stroke out of one of the bunkers, one of the more shallow bunkers of Wingfoot at 18. He doesn't have an easy shot by any means. Yeah. The ball is straight downhill from there and slightly fast. Bruce Crampton hit a beautiful shot uh, to this green, David. Yeah, it was his third play. shot. We'll return here in a moment. Okay, Keith. Now Tom Watson cannot possibly be exhilarated by what he just saw as Hale Irwin rolled in a putt that had to be at least 40 feet for the birdie on nine to take a shot off the scoreboard at plus five. A good run at it, but the ball will not swing back from that line, so he has that left to make par on nine. And he is going to be in second place, having surrendered the lead to Hale Irwin, his playing partner. Open Golf Championship at the Wingfoot Golf Club. The leader, plus five, Tom Watson now, one back of him. Here again is Chris. All right, Jack Nicholas on the 18th or 72nd hole. 13 over, 200 on his round today. He has to make this putt, uh, David Marr, to come in with a round of 68. It would be one of only eight under par thus far. Well, it's, the course has just been so tough this week. It's really uh, uh, something to see. There was a lot of talk about breaking 280 and so forth, but... Obviously, there's no chance that anyone's going to break par here. This for a 68. And a comeback putt for a 69. Today, the only other under par round was Al Geiberger, David, a 68. Well, he's a good straight driver. This would be the kind of course that Al should play fairly well. Mm -hmm. He finished at 17 over, however. Okay, Jack Nicklaus with a one under round of 69. He is in at 14 over. The great Jack Nicklaus. Next year at Medina. Number three course at Medina outside of Chicago. About 15 minutes from O'Hare, David, will be there to bring you the United States Open. That's where Dr. Kerry Middlecoff won the first time. What a course. All right, Jim McKay. All right, Chris, here we are on the 12th tee with Forrest Fesler, one of the young players on the tour who's been playing very well here, and he's at plus nine, remember. Tie with Bert Yancey now, fourth, third place. Forrest Fuzzy Fesler, they call him. His family goes for alliterative names like that. There you see where his ball is. Now back to you, Chris. All right. Let's get another look at... Uh... The 10th hole here at Wingfoot, David. 
Well, the thing that's amazed me at number 10 is that uh, the players haven't played the hole a little bit better this week. They don't seem to watch the tee. If the tee is sort of aimed to the right of the green and the wind is usually blowing left to right, Chris, and if you don't watch it, you find yourself aiming into the right trap, which is what happened to Bargancy a moment ago. He started the ball, what I'm sure he thought was fairly straight, and yet the tee aims to the right. I'm, I'm really surprised they haven't aimed more to the left or gotten to the right side of the tee to tee up. This for two on the par three tenth with a four over front nine Arnold Palmer, a 39. He is 10 over. Well, he's got to get something going if he's going to have any kind of chance. Huh? The putt that he missed at eight uh, is very missable unless you play here a lot. Both the putt that he and Hale Irwin had don't go the way they look. David, a rarity. Since we have so few birdies, let's replay two birdie putts. First, Hale Irwin to take the lead. This is what you call on the tour draining it from about 40 feet. <laughs> draining it? That's a huge stretch in this game. Running it out. <laughs> That's right. Looked like he was going for a pass defender. Now another birdie. This one Arnold Palmer at the tenth hole. Oh, the middle of the cup, dead center. Now if he can uh, do the reverse of what happened to him in San Francisco a few years ago, he is all right. We'll be back. From the blimp, you get a view of the Tudor-style architecture of the clubhouse behind. The 18th green, the final hole, and this is the final day of the United States Open. And at the moment, Hale Irwin leads Tom Watson by one shot. Irwin making a birdie putt at the ninth hole, be playing the 10th. Arnold Palmer played the 10th a moment ago, birdied it to be nine over now. And here you see a shot of the 10th tee. Just adjacent to our tower here behind the 18th green, David. Yeah, and this is really a fine hole. Now, the trees are down the left side, and you really can't feel the wind. He's got to look up to the left a little, and there's a flag there, and I think that's where a player should sort of get the idea of which way the wind is blowing for sure and just how hard it's blowing. But as I said a moment ago, he's got to watch how he lands up here. There's a good view from behind the green because the tee definitely is cut so that it aims a little bit to the right. Through no fault of anybody's, it's not uh, tricked by any means. It's just the way it's cut. No, but it's a thing that uh, an average golfer will forget to look for, David. That's right. Too often you line up just where the tee markers are, and it, it may be just a little bit off. And you see the problem he has there. He's got to start the ball, I think, just inside the left-hand uh, bunker at the green. And just let the wind bring it into the right. He's got a uh, pretty good amount of room to work with there. Bird Yancey uh, still in the battle. Had quite a uh, putt for a par a moment ago. A birdie putt, rather, and uh, it's certainly worth seeing since the birdies are so few. This putt looks like it's just about to get out of the hole there, and it must have been a good speed because it went in. Bird Yancey, and now Hale Irwin, the leader. By one shot, he is five over. Oh, well, I would assume he's probably got a three or four in his 190 yard hole. Don't know where the ball finished exactly. Well, the right rough, uh, not quite as far, not quite as long as that of Bert Yancey a moment ago when he had his tee shot here. But that is absolutely dead to the right over there. You just can't manage to get anything on the ball or to play any kind of soft shot out of the tall rough that you feature at the open. David, here they are head to head. Here they come. I they may watch each other and let someone else sneak in is what may go on, too. Tom Watson. He found the green. He's got a long putt, but that's a good shot. I'm, I'm amazed a lot of times at some of the really good shots that, that are hit under pressure. And, of course, some of the other shots aren't too good, either. <laughs> there goes Hale Irwin, ready to move up the 190 yard, down the hill off the tee, then up again. Let's take a look at the swing of Hale Irwin, slow motion, David. Okay, looks like he's aimed to the left all right there. As his stance is a little bit more open than I would think you, you might want to have. Now, remember the wind is left to right, and he's probably trying to play a left to right shot. He takes it back. It looks like a good turn. There it is. He just moved down to his left side a little before he completed his backswing. 
and this moves him out of position as he gets in the impact area, which moves the ball out to the right. I'm sure he started it right of where he was trying to start the ball, and then the wind carries it even more. It's uh, very difficult to, enough to get down in two out of the traps, much less out of the tall grass. The pressure final nine. That can make errors come up. Well, Chris, that's... That's what it's all about. It's, I think, not only a question of how well you can play, but how well you can control yourself and, and your nerves. Look at that shot. I'm not sure that kind of a shot makes you want to play the par 3 <laughs> tenth hole. That's right. Oh, boy. Keith, there he is. I'm Keith Jackson. Byron Nelson and I are sitting behind 11, watching the action as they make the turn. And that par 3, 190-yard tenth hole, Byron, is a tester. It really is. It's a hole that you might expect to make a two on, but there's been more fours than twos. As you see, the green is guarded by three large yawning bunkers, and they're quite deep. The green's somewhat elevated with a lot of slope to the front. And as you can see how the players have played the tenth hole up to now for the first three rounds. The 11th hole, 382-yard par four. That little trap sitting up there by the green has gobbled up a lot of hopes this week. They really have. There's been uh, 70 players in that bunker the first round. It's guarded there. You don't see all of it from the fairway, so they misjudge the club a lot of times. And now then, we go to the 12th. And on the 12th hole, 535 par five, the placement of the drive so important if you're thinking birdie. Yes, it really is because there's a mound. You come out of a chute and there's a big high knoll out in the fairway. It kind of blocks your view to part of the fairway and also some of the green at that point. But as you move up the fairway, it's guarded along by these beautiful but awesome looking bunkers, as you see, all the way up to this green. And very few people have been able to reach this green at two, practically no one. A look at 10, 11, and 12 here at Wingfoot. Thank you, gentlemen. You know, in not only playing the game of golf, you can make errors, <laughs> there will be flaws, but in reporting on it, you can, because it takes a lot of fine people in our scoring system, identification system, and Hale's tee shot on this par three tenth was not as bad as we reported. Well, I'm sure all the Hale Irwin fans will be glad to hear that. And In fact, all I'm Watson, glad for him. You know, I don't want him to be out there. Be <laughs> so but there he is. That's where his tee shot landed. His problem here, he's in the tall grass, uh, and as we pointed out so many times, it doesn't look too bad there, but again, it's very difficult to judge exactly how the ball will come off the club face. It, you get a little grass between the ball and the club face as you hit it, and it'll tend to squirt sometimes, and sometimes it'll come out soft. You're guessing a lot of times. Probably about an 8-iron or a 9-iron out of the rough there. He's very close to the, to the green, and it's very, very fast, as we've said many times. Still a long putt for his par three at the tenth. Here's Jim McKay. And this is Forrest Fesler putting for an eagle on the par five 12th hole. He carried the green in two with a strong tailwind. Oh, very difficult putt. And he sure gave it a try, and now he's got a tough one coming back for his birdie four. However, that birdie would move him. He makes it down into a tie with Bert Yancey for third place, just three shots off the lead. Okay, Chris. All right, that's Hale Irwin and Tom Watson without uh, a visor or cap. I think it's very important that they, it's almost instinct that you're watching the man that you're playing with or that you are that you think you've got to beat, but if they start to beat each other, you can see what can happen. Uh, Forrest Fesler just ahead of him has it, still has a chance, or Palmer just ahead of him. They can't let down for a minute and just worry about each other because uh, someone else may sneak in. All right. Ooh, and now he has even a more difficult putt for his three at the tenth. Oh, that wasn't uh, wasn't the time to hit a putt like that. He he was going more downhill than Hale was, and he's knocked it about uh, 10, 12 feet back. You know how in sports uh, the old show business adage, "What have you done lately?" Well, <laughs> feeble applause that you heard in the background a moment ago was for last year's Open champion Johnny Miller coming to the 72nd hole. He is 22 over. There he is. And it was last year when he had that round of 63 in the final round to win it. This is the par for 18th, last year's United States Open champion, a great winner. A tremendous athlete and person. Well, as you can see, that's part of the reason uh, <laughs> that you're 22 over. When you can't get the doggone thing in the hole, it, it becomes a little bit of a mystery. Another great one, Jerry Hurd is 22 over. There are the two men on the 72nd hole, so there's Johnny Miller, the winner last year. He'd like to forget about this year. 
and he looks forward to Madonna next year. <laughs> you can tell he should be kind of glad that's over. 302 is a little different than 279. I'm sure he's a tired young man. Today. Now let's look 90 degrees, David. Uh, the tenth here, just 90 degrees as we saw the 18th green, and this is Tom Watson who trails by one. He's got to make this to save his par three at the tenth hole. Leaning on the putter at the top of your screen, that is the leader, Hale Irwin. He's got to make it. He just got to keep the pressure on Hale if he's going to have a chance to. Win. He knows it better than I. Do. Mm. We've seen so many three putt greens here. You get where Tom was, even though he was on the green, it's straight downhill. Here's the birdie putt of Boris Fesler. He's never won. This is his third year on the tour, but he sure come close. He was second three times in 1973 and won $106,000. He could win the United States Open today. If he makes this, he'll only be three shots out. He's got it. Okay, Boris Fesler goes to plus eight. Just three shots behind the leader, Hale Irwin, two behind Tommy Watson, and tied with Bert Yancey. Now back to you, Chris. All right, here's the leader who has to make this putt. It's a uh, putt for a three at the tenth hole. He is five over. At the moment, leads by two. If he misses, he'll lead by only one. Well, he's just got to keep the ball in the hole. It's a little bit uphill, and the kind of putt maybe you can be a little bit bold on if, if there is such a thing this week here. And oh. he, he never got the glove on the ball in. He just... Never got through it. So we have, uh, goodness sakes, Dale Irwin at six, Tom Watson at seven, uh, Forrest Fesler and Burt Yancey at eight, and Arnold Palmer and Jim Colbert at nine. So, oh, this final nine, the inbound nine, is going to really produce some spectacular results. No question about it, Keith. Well, you're looking at the closing gasp of some considerable drama that Arnold Palmer provided on 11. That was for a par 4 on 11. Relatively simple, 382-yard par 4, but he jerked his tee shot in the rough, jerked his uh, second shot down below the green, chipped it up brilliantly, then tapped in for his 4, and he walked off with uh, a plus 9. A great 4. Fired. It really was a remarkable third shot that he played. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to show you. 13. 212 yards. The pin is cut in the deep left side of the green. Forrest Fesler takes a full rip at it, and this young Californian oh, has got his head down, and he's only two shots back of the leader, Beautiful. and he's hollering at it and talking to it, and it's short. It is short, and it's a long way down. That must be a 60-foot putt and more from there putting up. On the 11th tee, Hale Irwin's tee shot. This is a simple little hole, as I said, but it can jump up and bite your coattail, and Hale Irwin's jerked it off into the left rough, and that's the deep over there. You have to wring your pants out today because it's really juicy after the rain, really deep in that area. That's it where goes in Palmer there, was. and you can hardly see it, Keith. That's right. Poor Caddy Ark. He didn't put his hat on so he wouldn't lose his hat. <laughs> <laughs> you can see it comes almost up to the poor Caddy's knees. Here's Tom Watson now, who's staggering some. He's plus seven. Having three putted for a bogey on ten. Let's see where he puts his tee shot. Hitting a three wood, I would imagine. He's coming down the left side, and he's just on the cut grass, and here's Jim. And here is Bert Yancey. He is here in two, just short of the green. And he's not going to be happy with that shot. Not at all. He's left himself way down the hill from where the cup is cut here on this par five hole. He'll do well to get down in two putts for a five. And so the action goes on, ebbing and flowing in the U.S. Open. We'll be right back. Bert Yancey has this attempt for a birdie. It's a difficult one, 33 to 35 feet long on the 12th hole, a par five hole. He's made a good effort, but he'll have that left for the par five to remain eight over for this championship and two shots out of the lead. Back to 11 and Keith. Tom Watson just managed to keep his ball on the short grass down the left side of the fairway. Byron probably hitting an eight. I imagine so because he wants to get the ball high and be sure he gets over that bunker like he did it real good. Matter of fact, it is an action shot about 15 feet right in back of the hole. It does not creep back, sits up there because the greens are a little bit softer, what with the wet weather. Meantime, his playing partner, Hale Irwin, who is the leader at plus six in the tournament, is in the rough. 
And he... it all depends on how good his luck was when the ball went in. Right. Of course, as you can see, you can't see his white shoes. See, it's about it's well above his ankles. And as you say, you cannot tell how badly the ball is sitting, but he will do very well to put the ball on the green from there. As we pointed out before, that little trap that has gobbled up so many golf balls is right in front of him. He's got it up in the air well. He hit it very well. A beautiful shot by Hale Irwin coming out of the deep, deep, deep rough, and he's in there for about a 22. Here's Forrest Fesler now. On 13 with that long, long, long putt. Hit an iron on this 212-yard hole, and is, I just don't think an iron with the wind blowing in your face is going to get you very close to the hole, but let's see what he does with this. Oh, look at here. Keith, I don't believe the way some of these putts are doing, Dave. Kurt Yancey for the par putt. He has it. And he remains plus eight, two shots out of the lead. He has concluded 12 holes now, six to go. He has played the downwind 12th. Later, he'll be playing upwind on 16, 17, and 18. Bert Yancey, the one-time West Point cadet. This is a good shot of Jim Corbett on the 12th fairway here. His second shot on this par 5 hole. He's in the rough, as you can see, using a wood. It was unlikely he'd be able to carry it from there. He's a long way from home, even with the wind at his back today. Strong shot right on the right-hand side of the fairway, but he'll be about 120 yards from the green for his third shot. Jimmy Colbert is plus nine for the championship. He is only three shots out of the lead, along with Arnold Palmer, his playing partner today. Remember, Palmer birdied 10 to get back in the fight. But here he is. The interesting thing about Arnold playing so well here is that he has not been playing well in recent weeks. In, in fact, he failed to make the cut, failed to qualify for the final 36 holes in four of his last five tournaments. The only one in which he did make the cut was the Masters, in which he finished 11th and played well. The great men play well in the great tournaments. This is his second shot on the par five. And let's see if he's going to try to carry the screen. Looks like the wind is waiting. down a little bit at the moment. He's He's gone off to the uh, to the right in the rough. So Arnold Palmer will have a problem shot over there for his third on the par five hole. He's three shots behind the leader. On 11, Keith. I'm sitting here with Byron Nelson. Byron, talk us gently through a very piece, a very delicate piece of work that Hale Irwin's looking at. Well. Hale uses the plumb bob system, which I've never quite understood, but they do it very well, the ones that use it, and uh, Hale is putting slightly uphill. Uh, it's about a 20, 22 foot putt, and it will break slightly to his right. It's uh, really about as simple a 22 foot putt as you can have on this course, because there's not much to uh, do except just properly get the right speed. It broke a little to his right. This hole has been productive for a lot of people today. Larry, Larry Ziegler knocked one in way out there in the rough for two, and Ellen gets another birdie. Boy, his day has been really unbelievable. That takes him back to plus five and gives him a two-shot lead over Tom Watson, who's now looking at a 15-footer, and that's worth another look because that ball rolled up there, staggered a little bit, and then fell in the side door. I didn't think it was going to go out. It was going to curl on away, but had, he had just enough of the ball over the edge of the hole for it to tumble back in. He had a perfect speed. That's what I said, uh, Keith, that it's a speed putt. Now, young Tom Watson has a different putt entirely because he has very, very fast from here. Frank Beard hitting his tee shot on 13. It appeared that Frank had a wood in his hand. And he's jerked it way down into the deep left rough. It'd be extremely difficult to make three from down in there because the pin's cut close to the left side, the golfer's left side, or the right as we look at it. In the meantime, we come back to the 11th green now for Tom Watson, who is studying a birdie opportunity of 15 feet. You know, Keith, uh, uh, Hale Irwin has kept the pressure on Tom all day. He's put the butt in closer or further away. He has put it up there all day. Now, Tom has a slight break to his right. And it's downhill. He can just barely roll it because this will go fast. He's going to miss it. Get it, get it, get it. No, he's not. Yes, he is. I just didn't think he had enough left right. on it. He got it to the right side and never did give it a chance to bend a little bit. Looked in, but it wouldn't drop. Sure. 
And you can see that putt, even though it was just barely rolled, when it got the hole, Keith, it's uh, three feet past the hole. Now he has a tricky little putt coming back. But he's been doing these quite well so far in the tournament. But Hale rolled those in in front of him each time uh, makes his putts that much the harder. I tell you, though, Byron, if you're going to put the birdies on the board, you better do it along this stretch with the wind at your back. Right, because you get out and get back in at that 16th hole, you really got it. Oh, he almost missed that. Now, I want to tell you, that was not a positive putt at all. But Hale Irwin, in the meantime, here on the 11th, as we look at a replay of his birdie putt to assume a two-shot lead. See, that thing started to curl away and just walk, walk back in the side door. In the meantime, out on 12, Arnold Palmer is in trouble. Here's Jim. Yes, he is. Remember that he uh, put his second shot on this par five hole well to the right. And he's going to have to come up over some trees. He almost got into real trouble with a scraggly little pine tree there. He's going to have to come up over these, get it up quite quickly to get on the putting surface. The wind is at, him, at his back. He doesn't want to be too strong out of the long grass. And with the wind at his back, it's going to roll and roll when it gets on the putting surface. Slight side hill line. It shouldn't bother him. Okay, he's got it through. We'll see where it's going to finish. Short, short. Way down green from where the hole is, but he's on in three. If he can get down in two, Arnold Palmer will remain plus nine, four shots behind the current leader, Hale Irwin. If they're going to make the birdies, remember, they should be making them downwind. Win here on 12 and on 14 and to an extent on 15. Now back on the 12th tee, again, this same par five we've been talking about. Here is the leader in the tournament, Hale Irwin, fresh from another birdie. Two shots ahead of Tommy Watson, three ahead of Bert Yancey and Forrest Fesler, four ahead of Arnold Palmer and Jim Colbert. Okay, took a good swing at it, as you saw very well. I can't quite pick it up from here. Okay, fine, no problem. Now back to you, Keith. All right, Bert Yancey, coming out of the bunker on 13. He didn't get out. He, he got out of the bunker at all. He hung it up in the high grass. I think the ball may have rolled back in. Meantime, let's go back to Jim. And Tommy Watson on the 12th tee. And there's his ball just in the rough. But as you can see, it's sitting up quite well. And he's on the proper side of this fairway. He will be able to give it a try to carry the, the green if he wants to. Back to you, Keith. All right, we'll watch uh, Bert Yancey now, who suddenly run into a whole lot of grief on the 13th hole, one, a 212-yard par three, and the ball did roll back into the sand. This he, is one of three hole sand traps, I think, Byron, that right. have uh, he really has. Them. He really has a tough shot now because he's got to hit in and under it and hit straight up, which he did, and see him lose his balance. You can't go through from there. And he really did well to get that ball out at that particular time. But he is a long way from the hole, coming up over the a little crown, and the ball's going to break sharply as it starts to die and comes back at it. Let's take another look at it. I started to say this is one of three sand traps on the golf course that have great big rocks and a big boulder that have been marked out. Byron? Here's Bill Fleming with Forrest Fesler. Yes, and Forrest is on the 14th hole with a bit of a problem. His tee shot caught the right rough, and he's got about 175 to 185 yards into this green. Now, it's holding a little better today, but the advantage you might get with a little a wetter green is neutralized by the wet rough, which makes it tough to get that club through. Let's see what happens. Comes up, rolls across, and goes down the slope. And that looks like real trouble for Forrest Fesler to try to keep pace with Hale Irwin. Okay, let's go back now to uh, Keith. Look at this slow motion. This is a kind of a shot, I, I would say, on a day like this where a fellow could actually hurt himself, Byron. Yes, he really can. You see, he has to pull up and away because he's going up the bank so straight away. And see, he has to fall back and hitting through and hitting the ball up. He really, see, he almost loses balance, almost falls. And uh, because that bank is absolutely straight up and down where that ball was. I don't know how it stayed there. And really, it was a remarkable shot to put the ball even on the green after for his third. And Bird is facing the likelihood of a double bogey on the par 3 13th hole. The leaderboard shows Hale Irwin, plus five. Two shots back, Tom Watson, Forrest Fesler, three back, and then comes Arnold Palmer, Jim Colbert, Bert Yancey, but Bert is the man in trouble right now.
Uh, we'll go back now to the 13th green and watch Bert Yancey to see how he can solve this problem he has. You just really hate to, to lose strokes to par at this juncture because, as we've noted time and again now, as you turn into 16 and head back to the clubhouse, you're going right into a brisk wind. Well, Keith, you just realize that he had... <clears throat> I know he's thinking that he had worked himself back into position that he could win the tournament, and now then... Go in! Go in. Make a on this hole that puts him at the point where he puts him really virtually out of the winning the championship where he could have won the championship if he had made three on this hole. So Bert Yancey gets bit by the tough 13th as he needs about a three-footer to make double bogey. Now 12 and Jim. Okay, Keith. Hale Irwin. We'll be hitting here. Remember, there's a good tailwind. He wants to take a crack at it. He can. And uh, he may wait until the group ahead, Arnold Palmer and Jimmy Colbert, have finished. Because if he's going to go for the green, he obviously would not want to hit while they're putting. So if he doesn't hit, that is the reason why. And we can kind of read his mind. He had planned to play short. So... Uh, he obviously would have hit. So let's take a look at Jimmy Colbert. Colbert, remember, is still in it. Four shots out of the lead at plus nine for the tournament, plus one on today's round. This is for a par five, however, and it's not automatic. Question after they start going upwind, remember, will be not so much the birdies as... Whoops! Look at that. Look at that. A bogey for Jim Colbert. Bill Fleming on the fairway. And a bit of a predicament for Forrest Fesler behind the 14th green. Now, Forrest Fesler has about 75 feet between him and the cup, and the green slopes away from him. Incidentally, Yancey did get the double bogey, puts him plus 10, and uh, at this point looks like he's out of contention. A very soft, delicate shot and a beauty, I might add, by Forrest Fesler, who puts it up just about hole high, five, four and a half to five feet, and that'll be for his par. Jim? Arnold Palmer for the par five, 12 hole, two and a half footer. Takes care and makes it. Plus nine, four out of the lead. One of the five men at this point that appears are battling for the U.S. Open Championship. Behind him, Hale Irwin, playing with Tom Watson. Irwin the leader, two shots ahead of Watson. And here is Hale, and that win has stiffened at this moment. It comes up and down a bit. He can't actually see the flag stick, you see, and from this little depression he's in. But don't worry, he knows where it is, and he's going to be going for the green. There is a fairly good entrance, but you don't want to be too far left with it. Uh, he would like to have been further right on this hole, and he a little bit longer, too. He has hit the ball further on this hole. Well, it's right in the middle of the fairway and headed for the green. It's not going to be too much short of it. About 15 yards short of the green. A fine second for Hale Irwin, playing with great assurance now. The man from Boulder, Colorado, former Big 8, all Big 8 defensive halfback in football for Colorado, the Buffaloes. Now his playing partner, Tom Watson, who is in the perfect position to hit into this green. Now look, you see up where he is, you can see it. That's why it's a perfect position. And you have a straight shot into the opening, which is on the right-hand side of the green. Whoops, whoops, on the left, into the trees. That could be a horrible shot to you, Keith. And so, Tommy Watson seems to be running out of luck. Meantime, Arnold Palmer is up on the 212-yard par through the 13th hole, and he's drawing the ball back in, back in, back in, back in. He doesn't get enough on it and he doesn't draw it enough and he's in the bunker on the right 14 bill all right and Forrest Fesler looking over this four and a half foot putt for his par at 14 this young 24 year old who at one time was a high school quarterback playing behind Jim Plunkett back in San Jose California a year ago 73 open at Oakmont he won $930 I think he's going to win a lot more today right now He's three strokes behind. He'd like to keep it just that way with this putt. Oh, he saved the beauty. He remains at plus eight. So that's the way things stand as Hale Irwin, a 29-year-old from St. Louis, still in the lead by two.
On the tee at 15, Forrest Fezzler, Fezzler, Fezzler at, at 8 over par. Let's go now to Jim McKay. Okay, we're on the 12th fairway with Tommy Watson, who did the only thing he could do. From the forest, he just had a pitch out straight onto the fairway. So this is his fourth shot. A good effort, but not quite fast enough. It's going to come back on him. Look at it, rolling back down the hill, and he'll have an extremely difficult putt for his par five. If he doesn't make it, he'll drop probably three shots off the lead because Hale Irwin, his playing partner and the leader in the championship, is in beautiful shape, lying two, about 15 yards from the green. Okay, Keith? Arnold Palmer. I can't tell. Well, he's not quite in the bunker, but he's still going to hit. I have to hit a sand wedge because there's a lot of sand in that tall grass, and he's hit it up over this great big green. It's a narrow, but that is a great shot. It, it is a great shot. That's a lot harder than if he was actually in the bunker. Mr. McKay. This, a key shot. this could be very much a key shot in the championship. Hale Irwin, if he can get this close enough to make the birdie, will have a real strong bit going, but the closing hole is yet to go. Byron, what about the shot? A little pitch and run, I'm sure he will. There it is, a little pitch and run because the ball short. It's not going to get up there too far, and it's a very difficult thing, like getting the speed of a long putt. However, he'll have that for the birdie. He should be able to get down in far figures, and he'll have at least some sort of fighting chance for the birdie here that could bring him back to plus four for the tournament. He leads by two right now. Okay, here is Tom Watson with the putt he needs for a par. It's a very difficult one. He's got to come up a little bit, and then it flattens out towards the hole. He's going well past, and that's his putt for a six that he'll have left, and that is not an easy one either. So Tom Watson will at least be plus eight, leaving him at the moment three shots behind Hale Irwin and a tie with Forrest Fesler. However, if Irwin can make this birdie putt, he'll pick up yet another. And then he will have six holes left to play. Kind of interesting the way our coverage has expanded that not too many years ago, we wouldn't even have started our coverage yet. And we've been on the air a good long while. Jim, I think that the shot that Tommy Watson just hit may have been the biggest shot at the tournament because if he could reach the green in two after Hale was short, he could have probably made a fairly easy birdie if there is such a thing here and gotten the honor away. You can see with his head down, I feel so sorry for him, but hitting that shot like he did and having to play out in a cinch six, it looks like if he could have put it on the green, made a birdie, and gotten the honor at 13 and put the ball on the green. You know how hard it is to get it on the green at 13. Right. I think he would have put a lot of pressure on Hale, and now it seems to have gone out of his grasp. Well, here is Hale Irwin. Day when you and I were talking the other day, about what it takes to win the Open. You, you didn't talk about backswings. You talked about a word called character. And that's exactly what it is. Comes into play from here on. Hale Irwin has left it short. He'll have this short one for a par five. Making sure of it. Okay, there's the par five. 15 fairway, Fesler and Frank Gipp. Forrest Fester looking over his second shot. 217 yard par four, 15th hole. Fesler went under par for the day. We missed his drive a few moments ago, but it was dead center and dead perfect. Out about 170 yards. And online it looks to be a Terrific shot. It takes the bite right at the hump that he'll now have to putt over, but a good shot as we see Tom Watson, Jim McKay. Well, Tommy Watson did make the putt for the bogey six. You can see the hair's getting a bit disheveled. He looks a bit discouraged. There's Arnold Palmer. Putting for a par at 13, and he missed it. So Arnold Palmer makes bogey at 13. So Arnold Palmer drops back to plus 10 for the 1974 U.S. Open Golf Championship. Crowd big under the weather conditions. It's really taking it there. You know, it's so difficult to play on uh, the last nine holes whenever you're coming in the championship, and the play is so, the course is so difficult as this. If you tighten up just a little bit, and some of the swings have gotten faster, the putting stroke has gotten shorter and faster, and it's just hard to control yourself under these type of conditions. Well, 13 has been a particularly difficult hole here in the last few moments. It was most damaging to Bert Yancey, and it was most damaging to Arnold Palmer. Take a look at the 13th. 
tee box back here at the bottom of the picture. You've got to carry the ball about 157 yards before you can get it onto the short grass, and the pin today is cut way back up in that deep left-hand corner. Right, and the wind coming across against you, it really, you must be a big iron hitter to reach that green with an iron, and Forrest Fesler, of course, who just played the whole he had a good long iron, was just down in front of the green and played that remarkable uh, roll-up putt real close to the hole. Hale and... Uh, Tom are both good long iron players, so we'll see what they use off the tee. I just don't believe, though, Byron, that anybody can get home with an iron with the wind blowing in their face like it is right now. No, I not up to the hole. I don't either. They're cleaning the trap a little bit because we've had a lot of action in it. I made a comment a moment ago about two or three traps out here at Winko having big rocks in them, and, and they do. Great big boulders, but here's the shot on the way. And 14. Here's Bill. And that was Arnold Palmer's perfect tee shot on this 435-yard par four. He's in great shape. Okay, back to 13. On 13, Hale Irwin and Tom Watson. Hale Irwin sitting right now rather comfortably in front. Three shots ahead of Forrest Fesler and Tom Watson. <clears throat> it could be that Fesler is the man of destiny here. You never know because he looked... Big, full, and loose and easy in that iron shot he hit a moment ago. He doesn't seem to be affected by the pressure at all. It's got to be very difficult to keep yourself from clanking a little bit at this juncture of the U.S. Open. Wood shot. Right. It needs to be if he wants to get a hold. He's not playing short. He's apparently the gallery likes it. Oh. I hear somebody say, oh, well, it's on the very front. So you can see how, how much more... Difficult it's playing as Hale went to a wood and still couldn't get it back in the vicinity of the pen. He's looking at about a 50 footer probably. And he's a. Uh, uh, Tommy's going with an iron as you see, Keith, and uh, he is a real big long iron player, but he's really going to have to jump on this one to even reach uh, up to the middle part of this green at all. At this point, he needs some birdies. He also needs something to give him a little security to restore his confidence. One more bad yeah. shot, and he might really be through for the day. It looked like he went off to the right with that one, and he did. Way to the right. Way down to the right side. So Tom Watson is struggling now as Hale Irwin is on the green with a long putt coming up. As we continue our coverage of the U.S. Open, for some details on some of the holes, let's join Frank Gifford. Hi, I'm Frank Gifford. I'll be located behind the 15th green along with one of the nice people you'll ever meet, former U.S. Open champion, former British Open champion, and Tony, you played the first two rounds here, uh, missing the gut, but your impressions of Wingfoot? Well, it's a great championship layout. Certainly, I think the toughest uh, open course I've ever played, Frank. It demands uh, great driving, great iron play, and uh, tremendous nerve on the greens. The greens are super. The course is in superb condition. Uh, it has been all the week, and uh, as you can see from the scores that have been produced under perfect conditions, everybody's finding it pretty tough out there. Okay, and of course, one of the real tough holes is the little par 313. It plays at 212 yards, and we as members here at Wingfoot have laughed over the years that they call this the 18th handicap hole, a very difficult hole, Tony. It is. The prevailing wind this week's been more or less into us on this hole, and uh, the majority of the players are hitting a two or a one iron into a very long, narrow green, and they're having problems with those bunkers on each side. That one on the right especially is very deep, and when you're in there, you can't see the flag out of it. And, of course, here's 14. We changed this hole, and the bunker you see on the left uh, with the new tee will catch a drive that isn't hit just about perfect. Very demanding driving hole. As you see, the driving area is very narrow, and uh, from the tee, you think if you clear that trap, you're all right, but that rough's very heavy. We saw Gary Player in there uh, yesterday. A well-bunkered green again with uh, long, long grass all the way around, and if you miss that green, the chip shot is not easy to these lightning-fast greens. 435 yards, par four. And then you move over to another very difficult hole, the 15th. The 15th has, well, it just has dynamite trouble on the left, and anything to the right is also going to hurt. And the golfers really have been laying up on this one. It plays at 417 yards, but you can still get in all kinds of trouble. That's right, Frank. Uh, the majority of the fellows have been playing a three-wood off the tee. This is leaving him uh, a hanging lie because there's quite a swell down in the middle of the fairway there, and uh, they're hitting up onto an elevated green, which doesn't make things any easier. You see those big gaping holes again around the green, the bunkers. They're very difficult. And on the green of 15, on the right, is Forrest Fesler. Meanwhile, Tommy Watson is looking over sand shot on the... 13th, the par 313th, 
But Forrest Fazler has really come on strong. He's won under par for the day. He's never won a tour event, yet he won $106,000 last year, Tony, so he has to be considered a super player. Oh, there's no question about that, Frank. If he, uh, if there is such a thing as an easy putt on these greens, he certainly has it in the right position anyway. It's going to be more or less straight, and it's about 30 feet. Watson with his bunker shot. Fesler's putt is on the way. Watson will have about eight feet, and Fesler comes up short by well, about two and a half to three feet. Forrest Fesler glancing over as he has probably so often at that leaderboard. Played a little too much break there. It did break a little bit from his left, but uh, as you say, left it short. But uh, he's, he's on the easy side still of the hole, although he didn't hit it quite hard enough, quite as hard as he would have liked. All right, and while Lou uh, Fesler looks over this, let's go over to Keith Jackson, who's with Hale Irwin. All right, Frank, and Hale is looking at uh, a putt, Byron, that I would measure in the vicinity of 50 feet. It's a long putt, and he's down putting up. You remember him long, right in front of him a couple of holes before while Forrest Fesler was in the same area and played the ball very close to the hole. It'll break a little bit to his right, and he's been doing these long putts exceptionally well today. See how far he is in the hole there. Break a little to his right and slightly uphill till he gets the hole and then breaks back to his right. I think I'd give him closer to 60 feet on the putt. Yes, at least. He was a tad timid, too, because he's left himself quite a bit. Left himself a good 10, 12 footer there. It's a long way up there. And to get a putt from that distance close to the hole, regardless of how good your touch is, is a very remarkable thing. And that's why Forrest Fetzer's putt was so good a few moments ago. Speaking of Mr. Fesler, let's see how he's doing. Lining up a very difficult putt for his par four. Actually, as Tony said, if he was going to be anywhere, this would be the place to be. He's about three and a half to four feet below the hole. Now on the right, you see a little green work going on by Hale Irwin. Hale Irwin in command. He's three shots ahead of the man on the left, Forrest Fesler. These, these putts are always important, Frank, as you know, but especially at such a crucial stage is the last four holes in the U.S. Open. These are really, this is when the hole starts to fill up. <laughs> of course, from here, they'll turn home into the wind, 16, 17, and 18. Fesler gets his par four at 15. He remains three shots off the lead of this man, Hale Irwin. Hale's got about a 12-footer now to save his par. And Byron, it'll be it'll be a little slower, I think, from that particular point than right. it would be it, anyplace else. It will. It's a, you must hit through it, and he, oops, hit. He tried to be sure to be sure he got there on that one, and of course that is the net result. He hit it a little too far past, and that putt is no gimme. It's one of those things that uh, can happen here on this when you get that far away from the hole. All right, Tom Watson has put his ball down, and Tom needs this one, having come out of the bunker, to save par here on this par 3, 13th hole. So if he makes this uh, to save par, and uh, Hale's going to bogey, if not double bogey, and as Byron said, that is not a gimme that he has. No, they're neither Boy. of these gimmies, and uh, Earth could crack right here for somebody, could right. it? Uh, there could be a switch here, you know, if he made this. Get his confidence back a little bit because he's it's hard for a young man that no more experience than Thomas had to keep his confidence in going with him. Oops. Well, the ball went down over the left side of the cup. He thought it would curl back just a little bit because the crown is in that vicinity, but he makes bogey himself, and now he's plus nine through 13. Now let's see what happens to Hale Owen. He is, as uh, we all have heard the phrase, not inside the leather. No, he's sure not. And he could have been uh, helped slightly by Tom's putt because uh, Tom's putt did go a little bit left, and that might help him a little bit with his line on this. That plus six that you saw there is assuming he makes this, and he does. So Hale Irwin completes 13 holes of golf at plus six. Bobby Jones, what a great name. Jack Nicklaus of the modern era, another great name. Comparison of the swing of these two men, the comments of Byron Nelson.
Well, I think you'll really see the difference in the way they play now and then. Here's the two great players almost of all time. Jones is a little freer and a little looser. You notice he has a lot of lag action here, and Jack Nicklaus a little firmer, takes the club a little longer, a little more straight away than what Jones did. And from this point, notice Jack's left shoulders come down a little bit more. This point, Jones goes way beyond part of horizontal point. His left foot is up very much like Nicklaus, except his right side is turned a little bit more out of the way. And Jack's hands a little bit higher and the club is not down as much. Now then, Jack, as he moves through here, you know, as he moves through a little more on the line of the club, keep the club a little bit lower. Jones's legs have straightened a little bit more. This is one reason why Jones could get a lot of power in riding this. And Jack stays down and back a little bit longer than what the great Bob Jones did. But still, the swings are very similar. Two great players. This is Bill Fleming at the 14th pole, and now Hale Irwin, who has a two-stroke lead over Forrest Pesler and a three-stroke lead over Tom Watson, gets ready to attack this hole, although maybe you don't really attack 14. If uh, you've played it three times, and he has, he has uh, one bogey and two pars, maybe you play it a little bit cautiously, especially when the United States Open is hanging in the balance with five holes to play. Again, 435 yards, slight dog leg to the left. And he's trying to play it just to the right edge of the, there it is, as you can see, just in the rough in the first cut. So it's not very uh, high grass because we can see the ball sitting up in very good shape. And certainly he has the entry into this green. There, you, in fact, you can see perfectly where he is. As the green opens up, he doesn't have to play over that new bunker on the left side that kind of snakes its way down the left side as the golfer sees it. Now Tom Watson, who has fallen three strokes back, but anything can happen, as you know, in the United States Open Championship. Young Tom, if he pars out, would have a 76 today, six over so far. And he hits a fine shot. Right up on the little plateau in the fairway, and he too, has a great way to enter this green. Jim? We call him Forrest Fuzzy Fesler. And there are many similarities between him and Tom Watson. They're both 24 years old. Fesler, 19 days younger than Watson. It's the third year for both of them on the tour. Neither one of them has won yet. Both have tremendous potential. They both went to college in California. Fesler at San Jose City College. And of course, Tommy Watson at Stanford. This is the 452-yard par four. Many people have not baited in two because here's where they turn into the wind. You've got to get out there, hopefully a little bit on the right side of the fairway. And he's gone too far to the right and into the rough, but as you can see, he's sitting up. It won't be too bad. We'll be back to see what happens in another minute. You see Forrest Fesler here. Forrest Fesler has a rather little uh, unusual but swing. He has a lot of kind of loose action in his legs. If you watch, it takes the club away, but now that he goes through from this position, see he's, he's moved back well on his right side. He's kind of braced, but as he goes through, watch he goes through both legs here. Feet, he's rolled over onto his left foot. You can see how his left foot turns out of the way, but he really stays under and winds up. I don't know how his back can stand it, but he, he really goes through. All right, Byron, and right now we're going to concentrate our efforts on Hale Irwin, who is about 175 yards away from this 14th green. Now, as I mentioned earlier, because of the rain last night, this green is holding a little bit better. During the first three days of the championship, it was hard, and the ball would come out of the rough and fly over the green. So now he does have a bit of a, a shot at getting it onto the green and a chance at another birdie. Up it comes, it's a beauty. It's a beauty. He rolls it about five and a half feet past the hole, and that very well could sew up the championship. It was right here yesterday, in case you were with us, that Gary Player took a disastrous six, a double bogey on this hole that could have wiped out the hopes that he had for winning another championship. But Hale Irwin now is in great birdie position. Should he make it, he would go three strokes up on Forrest Fesler and four up on young Tom Watson, who is here, getting ready to hit his shot. Incidentally, a couple of the players uh, at the first uh, tee today predicted Irwin would win this, and there's a fine shot by Tom Watson. All right, Frank. The second shot of Arnold Palmer in good position to the golfer's right as he comes off. You see 
with our remote camera. His second shot that hits beyond the pin and comes up towards the back. He'll have a birdie putt of about 35 to 40 feet. The ball still rolling, as you see, off this undulating narrow green here at 15. <laughs> and Arnold laughs as we go back to Jim McKay and Forrest Fessler. Okay, Fessler has been waiting for Tom Weisskopf and Gary Player to clear the green. And Stanley Gary Player, Player, the early leader in this tournament, is two over in today's round. It's plus 12 for the tournament. A long way to go into the wind now. The long slogging trip home begins for Forrest Fessler. In the rough, but sitting up rather nicely. This is the father of two on Father's Day. Father of one, excuse me. In Marilyn Sue only have one shot. See where it's going to come. I think it's off to the right. There's two trees guarding this green, and he is off to the right of the bunker, as you see, in a very long stop. Might have hit somebody in the gallery, but I don't believe so. I think it uh, caught part of that tree as it was on the way down. Fez are not happy with it, obviously. At plus eight, he's two shots behind. He doesn't know it, but soon could be three shots behind. Bit of minutiae on this young man. His family goes for alliterative names. He's Forrest Fuzzy, of course. His mother and father are Fern and Floyd. His brother and two sisters are Phil, Phyllis, and Fauna. However, he has nieces and nephews named Timmy, Tammy, Tommy, and Travis, if you believe that. <laughs> There's the blimp shot again of the beautiful, magnificent Tudor clubhouse of Wingfoot, the awning over the open porch where many people have been sitting all week. Cars parked on the adjoining other 18 holes. Let's go to Bill Fleming now. All right, and from that we go to a couple of fellows from Missouri. From Kansas City, young Tom Watson and a transplanted Coloradan who is now living in Missouri, Hale Irwin, the leader of the championship. Tom Watson still has hopes. He puts this in, he would be two back. And if Irwin did not make his, of course, it could remain that way going to the 69th hole of this championship. This is the 68th hole, and Hale Irwin took the lead for the first time on the 63rd, and he has increased his one-stroke lead at that point to three, to two, rather, over Forrest Fesler. So he's picked up one on Fesler and a couple on Tom Watson since he took the lead at the ninth or 63rd hole. Pretty straightaway, uphillish putt. Got a good one. Oh, just at the last second. It just veered off, as you saw. Almost unbelievable as Tom winces again. Incidentally, coming into today's round, he had taken only 84 putts. Can you believe that for this three rounds on these lightning-fast greens? Compare that with the record set by Bill Casper, who took 114 when he won it 15 years ago. But his putter let him down. Today, Tom did on this final round, whereas Hale Irwin, who three-putted four greens yesterday, has been putting just brilliantly in the final round. Yes, Bill? sir? There's one uh, peculiar statistic about this tournament. There's only three players playing in this rise 36 holes that played in the tournament in 1959. That's Player, Palmer, and Charlie Sifford. All right, and this for a birdie. If he makes this, school might be out because it would put him three strokes up on Forrest Fesler. Look at that. A birdie for Hale Irwin, and he now goes to plus five. All right, Jim. Meanwhile, Morris Fester has the tough one, remember. Across the bunker, and David, uh, certainly a problem here. David struck dumb by the <laughs> problem that we have. Not opened up. <laughs> there you are. It's, That's uh, what I figured. <laughs> if he's down in there fairly tight, he's just going to have to try to play it out and not worry about getting it too close to the hole. And I'm sure he knows until Hale made that birdie anyhow. If he could make three fours here at 16, 17, and 18, he would have a very good chance to win this tournament. But he's not going to be able to put anything on the ball at all. It should run quite a bit. run. Almost to the other side of the green, he's got a very long putt coming back again for the par. Arnold Palmer going for a birdie putt from about 25 to 30 feet. And a delicate putt it is. Downhill, it'll bend to the left. And he may have played it just that close. Great putt, and Arnold Palmer cannot believe the fate that has overtaken him here at Wingfoot, and what a story he has been. Tremendous gallery hanging with him. 
Let's go over to Henry Longhurst at 17. Now, on the 17th fairway, Hank. Where do you want to go? The British Open champion, Weisskopf. And I think that's the nearest one that we've seen today. Weisskopf, 15 over. Hard to believe it. Same as Nicholas when he passed here. So, as Weisskopf, we go back to uh, Jim McCain. Where the mustachioed forest pheasant will be putting for a par from a long way off, about 30 to 35 feet. The pheasant has had rounds of 75, 70, and 74 until today. Now back to you, Frank, 15. Hale Irwin on the tee, and he must know that he has a commanding lead at this point, but this hole, Tony, could cause him a lot of problems. He must be careful. Well, I see he's taking an iron off the tee, which... Uh... He's trying to, he's playing ultra safe. The majority of the fellas have been playing three woods off this tee, Frank. It's perfect, though. It's straight down the heart of the fairway, so he'll have a medium mine into this green. So Hale Irwin in good shape at 15. He has a three-shot lead over Forrest Fesler. And we'll go back to Jim McKay and Forrest. It's almost last gasp time for Forrest Fesler with two holes remaining. Remember, though, this is the kind of a golf course where somebody or anybody could take seven that it really is a little premature, even though he's three strokes behind, and maybe four if he doesn't make this. Will be four if he doesn't make this. It's a good effort. He's got it. Take it. Still alive. The 24-year-old from California. And when Dave Marr was talking to me earlier about character, I think that's what he meant. Is that it, Dave? That was a very good effort and a lot of character to make four from where he did. Because he's out of, almost off the world. Hey, how about another look at that? There it is. Great speed, and he kind of got up on his toes about this point as it went straight back down the middle of the hole. And once more, for the West Coast, for Haywood, California, where he was born. That's it. Be quiet now because there's somebody else playing here. But there is a determined Forrest Fesler. And again, from the blimp, the 36 holes of wing foot. Irwin leading by three. Four of a Watson. Five of a Palmer. We'll be right back. Now we're back to the 17th. One of these very strong finishing par fours at wing foot and we see man with the flag running right over and he's running right over to the right and that looks as though it's Fessler in the rough on the right among the trees well then it's it's Fessler playing path and we wait for Fessler himself here's a path here we are Now, he seemed very happy with that, just walked on afterwards. It nearly always means it's down the middle. Yeah. Right, and we go to Frank Giffen. For the second shot of Hale Irwin, a very critical shot, heading to a narrow green, yawning bunkers on either side of the green. And Hale Irwin is short of the green in front of the bunker to the golfer's left. He will have a very difficult approach shot from there, wouldn't you say, Tony? Because Terribly. he'll have to come over a mound. Terribly difficult. Over that mound, it'll be very, very... He'll almost have to chip it right on the edge of the trap to, to run it down there. He's got a really tough uh, job ahead of him to make a par here. All right, Tommy Watson, then, again, not altogether out of it, even though he is four shots back with his second shot at 15. And he didn't like it. It's gone right. It's got the big bunker to the golfer's right, as you see it, to your left. This is by no means over yet, Frank, you know, with this finish uh, ahead of these fellas. Uh, I think it's one of the most formidable finishes I've ever seen on any championship course. There's so many long iron shots and that just that little fraction, if the tempo goes for a little fraction, they rush it a bit, get a bit quick. It's so easy to finish, uh, play the holes well and bogey them all. There's Forrest Fesler's ball on the 17th. You see he's not in the traps, but he's got a lot of tree problems there. There's no way, I can assure you, I was out there that uh, he, he'll see the green and uh, so he'll be uh, trying to pitch it back out in the fairway and hit a short iron, hopefully in on the green. 
And now here on the 18th tee, 448 yards away from the green, par 4 18th is Gary Player, who led after the first round with a 70, but has found problems ever since. Gary Player. He is 12 over. He hit the ball perfectly, just to the right side of the fairway, Chris, and it's just perfect. Gives him that wonderful entrance to this elevated green and a tricky green. Well, in the hole plays so long, too. He's playing along with Tom Wyskoff. They've added 30 yards this year, and it's just into the wind today. Mo more players are hitting woods than any other. Wyskoff 15 over, player 12 over. Uh, the defending British Open champion. It won't be long. David will be going there. Litham and St. Anne's to That's bring the fans that telecast. And Tom Wyskoff has gone way to the right. I hit it long, but to the right. Yeah, that's <laughs> the good news and the bad news. I hit it real long, but I can't find my ball. I thought Tom would play very well here, Chris. I thought he'd played here so many times and really looked like he'd have a good chance here. Let's go back to the broadcasting member, Frank Gifford. And I'll let Tony Jacklin describe the shot because it Tommy is Watson. difficult. Well, Tommy Watson's going to play first, Frank. I think he's in that right trap. He's got a difficult shot. She plays out, a little bit strong, downhill putt, very fast. Frank and I have been discussing this shot that Hale uh, Irwin has here, and uh, I think between us we've deemed it Im impossible, <laughs> uh, Frank, uh, certainly to get it within, uh, if he gets the ball within six feet of the hole, he'll have played a really wonderful shot here. It's very difficult to, to see that swale in the screen, but it's... Uh, it's there, Tony. I have tried to come over on numerous sure. occasions with... Freddie Corcoran, whose home is right off this screen. Freddie Corcoran, of course, known to so many of the golfing fraternity and a member here at Wingfoot for 25 years. His family looking on from their porches. Hale Irwin has this very difficult third shot on the par 4 15th. He's going to try, he's going to play this with a sand wedge or a pitching wedge, and he's going to try and flip it as high as he dare. But he can't obviously get a, uh, very much spin on it from being so close to the green as he is. I'm sure he's not going to get too cute with it. He's just going to try and get it somewhere as close. He's going to roll off now. Short right. He's played the sensible shot. He's left himself uh, the uphill putt. Uh, he didn't get over cute. He's got that cushion there, uh, Frank, and in a situation as he was in there, he's got to take advantage of it. Okay, now over to Henry Longhurst at 17 and Boris Fesler. Now on the 17th. Fesler pushes drive out to the right, and there he is through the trees there with no hope, we think, of getting the green. 444 yards. Let's get as near as he can. There he is, right through the trees. And now we wait to see how near he... Oh, that's a very fine shot. It's in the bunker, I agree, but it's a long shot from there, and in the bunker on the left of the green, rather short of the, of the flag in that bunker looking just over the flag there as we look down on it. He's about 25 yards, 30 from the hole. So we'll go back now to Frank Gifford. And we'll pick up Tommy Watson, this putt for a par. We're about eight or 10 feet. Watson, four shots off the lead. And again, Tommy Watson just missing by so close. Yeah, they're not going in for him today. The ones only that fell yesterday are not falling today. I'm sure he wonders where that lead went to. It all happened so quickly. All right, while Hale Irwin lines up his par for a putt, let's go over to Jim McKay. Arnold Palmer into the wind on the 452-yard par four. He changed his club once, a little insights as on what he needed here. He needs a lot because a lot of people have left it short, as we said. Starts it off to the right, drawing in. Looks like a great shot. Still, the wind kind of stood it up when it got to the putting surface, but to get to this green is an achievement in itself today. Arnold, however, didn't like it, Frank. Hale Irwin looking over his putt for a par four. He has that cushion that Tony Jacklin spoke of, of a moment ago. He played his third shot so that he would have an uphill putt, a fairly straight putt, not a difficult putt, but again, the distance is the factor. So Hale Irwin will bogey 15. And although Forrest Fesler is in trouble at 17, Hale Irwin maintains a two-shot lead. 
and the pressure mounting here at Wingfoot. Hale Irwin, the winner of only two tour events on the threshold of a U.S. Open championship, as this young man was yesterday, although he's faltered today, he's played tremendous golf, Tommy Watson, putting for a bogey. This will be 11 over par for Tommy Watson. And Hale Irwin and Tommy Watson move over to the 16th tee. They turn for home, and it turns into dynamite, 16, 17, and 18. And from the blimp, a beautiful view of the 16th hole, the 16th green. Those are the standings. Hale Irwin playing steady. He began the day at four over par. He's two, six over par, two over for the day. Okay, Henry, over to you at 17. Now we come back to the 17th green. And the bull you see in the foreground, or did a moment ago, is Lou Graham. We haven't mentioned him, but he's only 10 over. And now, first he's eight over, only two behind. And a very fine long shot to get there out of the trees. No, they don't come much better than that at a moment like this, and it's certainly no more than four feet. Four feet, sir. And he's hanging on absolutely wonderfully. Now we go to Chris Schenkel. Tom Weiskopf's third shot on the par 4 18th. He had hit it long and to the right off the fairway. Had to come over one of the high and beautiful trees here at Wingfoot. He has found the green with his third shot and will have about a 25 foot putt. Right back to Jim McKay. Taylor Wendt, Taylor on the 16th tee, and now it is his turn to turn in the wind. A wind which at this moment is beginning to settle down a little bit. Whether that's permanent or not, we don't know. Sometimes as you get near the end of the day, the wind will die down. However, it's still quite strong and gusty at this point. The spectacle leader from Colorado putting it off to the right. There you see it. And that's in some fairly long rough. He's going to have his problem. He's too far to the right. He could have tree problem coming up to the green. On the other hand, he does have a valid chance to get there, but he's not too happy with the shot. Now Tom Watson. Watson who lowered his score by two shots a day until today at 73, 71, 69. On today's round, he is seven over. Tommy, I think, has got a better one there. And there he is on the left side of the fairway. A little cozy with the left tree coming in, but he, he has a good, in fact, an excellent shot into the green, right into the opening. So Irwin and Watson have hit theirs as they turn into the wind. There you see how they stand. Now, Irwin just two ahead of Forrest Fesler, and that Fesler is tough right now. Remember, he holed about a 35-foot putt for a par. On the last hole, he's fighting again on 17. Let's go up to Chris Schenkel. From the long grass, Gary Player, who was the first-round leader and one of the few men to win all four major championships, just off a victory at Augusta, his second. This is his third shot on the 72nd hole. At the moment, he's 12 over. He's played a very nice shot there. Oh, hasn't he? Just as good as you could do out of the tall grass. He and Tom Weiskopf, Weiskopf, who won uh, last year's British Open and will be defending it this year at Lytham St. Anne's as we go back to our British commentator and friend, Henry Longhurst. Now we saw that brilliant recovery. I first left from the bunker on the left of the green. I should say it's four to four and a half feet. This would keep him within two of the leader. be two miraculous fours in a row for this young man, Henry. It would indeed. Oh, right in the middle. This championship's by no means over yet. It might well be the winner, although he's still behind at the moment. Presley just finishing the 17th. So now we go to Chris Schenkel, the 18th. All right, for a hard-earned four at the home hole, Tom Weiskopf, who is 15 over. This putt will really break to the left. I'm afraid he's got it a little, well, a little too hard to get all of the break that was there. Not too bad a putt. Tom Weiskopf, who started out at 11 over, will finish if he makes this three-footer at 16 over for after 72 holes. Tom Weiskopf. David, the uh, player's chip out of that long grass was a thing of beauty. He's remarking his ball here now. Let's see that shot again. 
Well, he's in the very deep rough, and I'm sure that what he what you try to do here is lead a lot with your left hand. Hold on very strong with your left, and you're not actually trying to hit the ball as much as you're trying to play a trap shot. You take a lot of turf there and get the ball as high as you can by letting your right hand pass your left just about at impact, but you've got to hold on very firm with your left hand. Now for a par four at the 72nd hole, Gary Player. There's the break I was saying that Tom's ball should have gotten. So uh, Gary will mark. Tom Weiskopf will try a putt for a five, a bogey five. So that's a round of 75 for Tom Weiskopf, 16 over. Tom Weiskopf. Let's go to Jim McKay. All right, now, Arnold Palmer has cleared the 16th green, along with Jim Colbert after making his par. Now, Hale Irwin has shown some of the same indecision that Palmer did. He has finally selected a wood club out of this fairly long rough. Got a long way to come into the wind. Let's see. Bunker. He's caught the bunker, and now he will have a chance to display his character as far as Fesler so well did before him. Fesler, having gotten in the sand on the last two holes and come out to get his par, now coming into the wind, we said that was going to be the decisive part of this golf tournament, coming into the wind, Irwin may have his problems. Here's Tommy Watson. Watson with a better angle into the green and hitting from the fairway, trying to stay alive somehow as a beautiful shot. A fine shot by Tommy Watson. There you see it. He's four shots behind, and just with that glimmer, only a glimmer of hope left. Remember, it's Irwin, two shots ahead of Fesler, four shots ahead of Palmer, and Watson, and Yancey, and Graham now. Some of the gallery, as they come from out on the course and begin to gather on the closing holes. There's the way they stand once again. The battle goes on at Wingfoot under cloudy skies. We'll return. From overhead, you're looking at wing foot as Hale Irwin begins the long drive for home. He's on the 16th hole. He was in the bunker, remember. He has come out of it beautifully. We're going to try to give you a look at the shot he hit while we were away. But he has left himself a considerable putt for the par four. Not as long as far as Fesler had here. Here again, here's the shot he had of the sand. You see it coming up. And there it is. It's about a 10-foot putt. He'll need for the par four. Tommy Watson playing with him. That's about a 15-footer. But Watson's is for a birdie three. Remember, Watson, four shots behind. There's Tom, 24-year-old, former Stanford player, doing the plumb bob things. That really helped, David? Oh, I think so. I, I don't, I'm like Byron. I don't know exactly how much that does help, but uh, <laughs> I know it doesn't ever help a bad putter. <laughs> guy that putts well, he seems to be born with it. Okay, for the birdie three. Quickly to Chris. Forrest Fesler, second shot on the home hole. Remember, he is eight over, only two shots away at this moment. He apparently has a clear shot, but he has to come out of some grass, some uh, grass that has been walked on a lot, and he comes off to the right and just into the fringe. So this is going to be a tough way to make a four at the 72nd hole. Okay, Jim. Tom Watson did not make the birdie. This for the par now. Interesting, what we're seeing here is great shots. Not to make birdies, usually, but to make pars. The great golfers of the world, he makes the par, of course. The great golfers of the world have not suddenly lost their skills before your eyes. What you're seeing is as difficult a golf course, almost all of them agree, as they have ever played on. But a fair golf course. The idea of the United States Open is to determine the greatest golfer in the world in this particular year in this particular week. Perhaps a real prophet would have seen something coming when Hale Irwin finished fourth in the Masters this spring, when he finished at second at Philadelphia very recently, earlier when he finished second in the Jackie Gleason. Last year, he won more than $130,000, yet in all the years he's been out here since 1968, he's only won two tournaments, and they were both the same one, the Heritage Classic down at Hilton Head Island. Thing, Jim. He likes the golf course. He thought at the first part of the week he would have a very good chance to win here, and of course he needs his putt to give himself a little breathing room. I'm sure it's getting a little stuffy out there. 
Feeling very close at the 16th green. Okay, the lead is down to one, at least momentarily. Henry. Now, the second shot, 70. Which he doesn't think very much of. And he's in the, not in the bunker, but in the rough stuff between the bunker and the green will go to Chris Schenk. Oh, the round of applause for this young man, Forrest Besler, is beautiful here at the 72nd green. Forrest has walked up on this undulating green to take a look at back toward the shot, which had just caught the fringe off the fairway. So he'll be hitting his third shot, but first it's Lou Graham who will be hitting his Graham at 10 over. Back first to the 17th tee, however. Now we go back to the uh, 17th tee. The last two. Tom Watson without the hat. And there we went the horizon. There we are, that's the position at the moment. Any odds on a tie between Irwin and Fisler? That's for my money. I see Irwin slipping a bit. And in the old days before they used to put the leaders out last, it was always reckoned there was a great advantage if you could uh, get a good score posted and get your blow in first. And so it will be with Fesler. There's the model of the hole, 444 yards, that distinct dog leg to the right. Ah, so we put him off. Tom Watson, 10 over. And while we're waiting, we go back to 18. And a good reason, because here is Forrest Fessler, David Marr, coming up with the biggest shot of his life. No question about it, right here. Well, he stood on the green. He's really looked the shot over. And while he was standing up here waiting for Lou Graham to play his shot, they changed the scoreboard at 18. So he knows that Hale Irwin is now seven over, and he is within one shot. So he knows that Hale still has to play seven and 17 and 18, and uh, I'd hate to try to make two fours on those two holes to win this tournament. Now, this is his third stroke on the par four, 18th, remember. It's almost, an, again, an impossible shot to get close to the hole. I think he's going to have to depend on some sort of long putt. If he could get within 10 or 12 mm -hmm. feet, he's played a good shot. He just hit that little knoll and ran by the hole yes. about 15 feet. That's about as good as he could do, Chris. That is the truth. Forrest Pesler who is eight over and out on 17. Hale Irwin is seven over. And of course, if there is a tie, we should point out, there'll be an 18-hole playoff tomorrow. There will also be a telecast tomorrow, David. Well, that's good. I'm just, everybody just, just shooting straight up here. Nobody can seem to make a par. All right, there's Forrest Fessler at the 18th green. Right now on the tee at 17, Tom Watson. Henry? Yes, Tom Watson here on the 17th tee. Ten over. Well, doesn't fancy it. Normally when they don't fancy it, they push it out into the trees on the right. And it's the right rough. And the boy running across with a flag. See you in a moment. It's a point two. Up, halo went. Lead only by one now. <coughs> well, he doesn't think much of that either. And it's just in the short rough on the other side on the left. We go back to Chris Shankle. Everything is very silent around the 72nd hole, the 18th green. Forrest Fesler, who has never won yet won over 100,000 last year, has had three second place finishes in big events. As you see the story visually, Hale Irwin at 17, seven over. Forrest Fesler at 18, eight over. This putt, 15 feet or more, perhaps a little bit more, is for a f four, par four, to remain eight over, David. Well, there's so many things that can happen if he does miss and in fact shoots 289. Hale's could possibly bogey the last two holes for 289. Anybody at 10 that could make a birdie could shoot 289. I mean, it's still, anybody 10 is not out of it. If he makes this, though, uh, you may have your champion right there. Like he 
Keeps it in a loop to the right. It went the opposite way. I could see him turn to Lou Graham. He, I felt like it might break a little to the left too. And just when he thought it was going to break the left, it moved out a little bit to the right. Just barely tapped it and that baby took off. Well, he still got one left too. I guess. This is for a bogey five to put him in at uh, nine over or 289. But by no means out of it. Dude. I mean, if Hale's in the rough to the left at uh, 17, he's got no cinch par there by any means. Now, if he makes this putt, force Fezzer, give him an even par round of 70 today, while Palmer, Palmer is for a par at the 17th green, he would remain then 10 over. Well, let's say they both got to make them to have any chance. Right. Well, that's the story of Arnold this week, I think. All right, for Forrest Fuzzer, he gets that round of applause at the 72nd hole. It's a bogey five. He finishes nine over. He is the leader at the moment with a round of 70. And congratulations from his caddy. Ah, oh, there's Luke Graham who hit a beautiful third shot to within less than three feet for his par four. Now he is 10 over. If he makes this putt, David, he'll be 10 over and in. Well, uh, with Forrest nine under now making that, I think that, uh, of course, when you're 10 under and you're just going to finish about third or fourth, uh, you don't have to qualify next year. And certainly, 290 around this course is some fine score. You'd be invited to Augusta and the PGA, and, and there's quite a bit of money at stake. All right, Henry? Well, now, here it's working up to its climax, and there is Hale Irwin on his left-hand side of the fairway. 70. Something put him off. You start again. Don't blame him. He's too ahead, so these two par four holes, terribly difficult par fours, he wants a four and a five to win. to do it. Maybe he had a bad light and we couldn't quite see the ball, but it's only gone about 130, 40 yards. Tom Watson. Watson, 10 over now. That is a left rough for Tom Watson. Way behind those trees for Tom Watson. We'll go down to Bill Fleming, who's down there for a report on those shots. All right, let's uh, take Watson's uh, shot first, the last one you just saw. Tom was completely blocked out from the green by a new tree that had been planted out here, a little maple tree that he doesn't have much affection for right now. So he just tried to, to punch the ball out onto the fairway and caught it flush. Can you believe that? and knocked it right across behind another big group of trees in the heavy rough. Now, as far as Hale Irwin is concerned, he tried to get home. He had a four wood, and he just literally topped the ball, and as you mentioned, Henry, hit it about 120 yards. <coughs> Chris, uh, back to you at 18. The 448-yard, par 4 18th, Arnold Palmer, who bogeyed the last hole, 11 over. This is the 72nd hole for Arnold. I'm sure after that bogey, too, Chris, he will try to crunch this one. Sure, he knows his chance to win. Well, like it well, sometimes when you hook the ball too much, it, it does hurt your back. <laughs> and he has found the rough here on the 18th hole. Henry? Well, now back to 17 here. And they're certainly having some adventures here. Down in the forest, uh, there is stirring Tom Watson at the moment. Hit a tree, gone off into the others. No hope, whatever, of getting onto the green from there, I think. We'll go down to Bill Fleming. He's down there. All right, underneath the branches of that tree, uh, Tom Watson hits it out, and as you can see, hits it safely out on, but that is his third shot, and he's using them up very rapidly on this par four hole. And now <coughs> Hale Irwin is in pretty good shape. If he can hit that chip shot up there and get it close for the one putt, then he has that little bit of a buffer. But right now, things are looming bad for Hale Irwin, if he went bogey-bogey, of course, this would all be tied up in, of course, a playoff. Okay, Henry. Oh, no, 
I would say that it's more than a chip shot there. With great respect to you, Bill, it looks to me, looking above the green, more like 120 yards. And if you can get it within 10 feet, you'll be doing very well. only get that one in he would have five to spare on the last hole but if he doesn't get this one in what a prospect of having to get a four Tom Watson and Pete Jackson well, we'll wait for one second yeah. and some beautiful fourth by some beautiful fourth by Watson but it is after all his fourth and it's Par four. And Chris Schenkel in the 18th green. All right, Bert Yancey. Looking over a putt, it'll be his third stroke on the last hole. At the moment, Yancey is 10 over, two over on his round today. He could make this what looks like an impossible putt as we're directly behind it, David. It would put him in at uh, nine. Well, he'd still have a chance to win because... Sure. Uh, Fessler's leading. Uh, Hale certainly has no cinch par at right. the 17th, and this hole is really uh, playing hard here. This is the best shot of the day, by the way, that I've seen at the, at the last hole. He had a great wood shot in here. And this ball will break quite a bit from right to left, down the hill, and then at the hole, start back up the hill. He's played it a little too high. Well, he had to hit it like that. It would be no time to leave the ball short. So you've got to give yourself every opportunity to get the ball in the hole. That was for three. The putt will be for a four, which will give him a round of 72 and 10 over, while Beard playing with him is 15 over. Let's join Keith Jackson. Chris, I'm standing here just off the 18th green or the 72nd hole with a young man who became a very dramatic figure as the day wore on. Forrest Fesler, who shot a 70 today, a brilliant round to golf, and now is in a posture of anxious waiting. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm really surprised. I thought if I shot 67 today, I might have a chance to win, but I never thought 9 over might have a chance to, to win a tournament or even come in second. I'm really surprised. You've had uh, second place finish three different occasions now. I thought perhaps the law of averages uh, were going to fall your way today. Of course, they still might. Yeah, you never know. This course is just so tough. I, I could have had uh, a couple of bogeys coming in myself on the last few holes, and I got up and down on 16 and 17, and... 18, I just had a really good chip shot and good puppet. That's Forrest, the I want you to is. stay here with me just a moment, but let's go back out now on the course to Henry Longhurst, who's watching Hale Irwin. Well, now he has one of the putts for Hale Irwin, perhaps in his life. And Irwin on the right. He ends it this for a pump. gets his power, but this is the one that matters. About ten feet. He's played three. It's power four. Oh! Well, what a putt. And what a moment. It really is magnificent by Hale Irwin. That's not a birdie. Well, so now, he's got that in hand. A five to win. Henry, that may have been the biggest putt he'll ever make right there. What a time to make a ten-footer. It could well be, and it was right into the middle of the hole. Now we'll stay and watch uh, Tom Watson, who had a great chance at the beginning of the day, but had to sleep on it. He's only ten over. Only three behind. This again is his fourth shot. Oh, well, he finishes with a good putt now, Tom Watson. And he goes to 11 over. Now we go to Chris Schenkel. All right, and David, uh, once more, videotape as we see Arnold Palmer moving back to his third shot on the par 4 18th hole. Let's see Hale Irwin's big putt. And it sure was. Look at that expression, because he knows... 
you got to know that you got to make a par somewhere and give yourself a chance to to win the tournament. He let those two bogeys, 15 and 16, get him, and sometimes it's very hard to turn off. All right now, Arnold Palmer, 11 over, third shot on the par four, 18th. Had trouble with his drive. This is where he put his second. Now his third. Third shot on the 72nd hole, the par four, 18th. And as we indicated, he finished fourth last year, tied for fourth with Jack Nicholas and Lee Trevino. Nicholas finishing today. Trevino failed to make the 36-hole cut. Uh, Jack Nicholas not having one of his better 72-hole tournaments ever. Finished at 14, as did Bud Allen. Now the round of applause for the Nicole legend. He's really something else. Look at the people. Right? Just... What can you say? Only that he deserves it. Well, that's for sure, but it, it's, it's really something else. Now he just turns them off. 11 over, Jim Colbert, 12 over. And I think there's some here that still think he's got a chance to win, the way they're yelling at him. <laughs> Right now, 448 yards away, Hale Irwin, the leader, who made that great putt at 17. He is seven over, leading by two. The final hole. <laughs> and a long look at those spectacles, and there it is in the fairway, a bit to the right of center, David. Uh, yeah, you, you could not dream of any better drive at the last hole. You, with the trees and so forth, you know you don't want to make a double bogey. What a time to hit a drive right in the perfect spot. Now Tom Watson, who led going into the play today at three over, he's now 11 over. Tough break. Well, that's too bad. He's such a real fine player and a nice young man. Thought out for a nice round of golf and it turns into a nightmare on you. And Tom Watson has hit it to his left as the golfer plays this dog leg hole. He is in the rough. See it being marked. See the four caddy now coming up with well, one of the marshals. And the marshals here have done a great job at your, formerly your home course, Davis, where you've been an assistant pro here along with Mike Suchak, Jackie Burke, Shelley Mayfield, just a host of great players that got a lot of knowledge from Claude Harmon. Well, that's true. And there are a lot of people that have done a lot of work that uh, don't ever get mentioned, like Gene Hayden, the caddy master, and Mo, the guy that takes care of the clubs in the back of the shop. And of course, Claude Harmon, the host pro here this week, uh, and all the members, the, the people that have volunteered their time from various committees to do a job. I'm going to put a pat on the back for Ted Horton. Oh, definitely. He's the greenskeeper, and he did an excellent job shining these greens to their slickness that they are now. Jim Colbert, who is 12 over, getting it up there about four feet away. This is the way things are as Hale Irwin is walking up the 18th fairway, leading by two. Forrest Fesler is finished. He's nine over. Lou Graham, 10. Burt Yancey, 10. Arnold Palmer is 11 at this point. Tom Watson, 11. Jim Colbert, 11. Colbert and Palmer on the 18th, and there is the Buffalo. What a feeling to walk down that fairway. You know there's got to be a thousand things running through his mind. He's got to unclutter that a little bit and just be sure that he doesn't do anything dumb coming down the last hole. 29 years old and from the blimp still an overcast day a few spots of blue sky throughout the afternoon but not the predicted storm Arnold Palmer this is almost the same putt that Weisskopf had earlier it should break from right to left and it'll be very fast once it starts to make the break to the left because then it'll be going with the hill to go in at 11 over that close for his par 4 so with a short putt, it'll be a bogey five. This pin position, David, is not quite the spot where Bob Jones, in 1929, made the historic putt. Uh, Listen to that. Well, it's just amazing. Uh, as you said, it's not quite the same spot where Jones made his putt from because, as we said earlier about the rain, they were expecting a lot of rain today. And they did move the flag from where it was in 29 uh, up to a little higher spot in the green. So in case you did get a lot of water, it wouldn't uh, be around the hole and you could play. 
Now Jim Colbert. This putt should break a little bit right to left, and an important putt for Jim because it will keep him, what is he, 12 over? Right. And uh, certainly another fine finish in a major championship. He played uh, very well at the Masters, as we said earlier. As a matter of fact, he made it two at the last hole there, if you remember. He needs this for a par four. Break from right to left. Definitely a speed putt. Also, a former football player like the leader, Hale Irwin, coming up the fairway. So, Jim Colbert is in with a round of 74 today in a 12 over, joining Arnold Palmer. Of course, Fesler in 9 over, back out on the fairway to the leader, who at this point is 7 over, playing the final hole. Hale Irwin battling, looking at the blimp. Well, we mentioned earlier about it being Father's Day, and I know Hale's wife, Sally, is uh, home in Colorado. And I'm sure she ought to just calm down a little bit now. It looks like he's got things under control after making that putt at 17. And a great putt we all remember at 7 for a 3, a great one. A birdie at 9, a birdie at 11, a birdie at 14. Mm. Well, those are things you have to do if you're going to win. You have to be able to control yourself as much as you can control the golf ball. I don't think he's got enough club here. There haven't been very many iron shots hit all over this game, but he's hit a wonderful little shot. The adrenaline. <laughs> Look at that adrenaline. On the flag. Well, as I said, he probably doesn't have enough club here, but he hit it absolutely like a champion ought to do. It's just a sign for a touchdown. <laughs> well, he just, he just scored right there. He sure did. Hale Irwin right on the flag here at the home hole. Isn't that something? Coming to the final hole, leading by two over Forrest Fesler. Mm. Well, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. He's worked awfully hard. He's uh, kind of a quiet guy in a lot of ways and just goes about his business and much the same as this young man. Now, he's taking a wood out of the rough, uh, possibly because he's got uh, a lad that's sort of sitting down. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a wood can get through there easier, but he pulled it a little bit to the left, and I think it hit the tree, didn't it? We talk about the beautiful trees that's under one that lost its top, and in the top of that tree are a lot of spectators here at Wingfoot. More later. This is Wingfoot Golf Club. It is the 18th hole, and the leader, Hale Irwin, is on with a beautiful shot in two, leads by two, and moments ago, as he came to the 18th green, this is the response and his reaction. Well, that's going to make your heart beat faster. That's right, man. Speaking of that, there are just a lot of heart, heart physicians, doctors. <laughs> Dr. Cosgrove and Dr. Irving and Dr. Ron Granson, who headed a great staff here. But the first two are Hendersonville, North Carolina golfers, who uh, helped save the life of one of our favorite guys, Rune Arledge Sr., well, they're watching this event, and uh, I know that they're cheering for Hale Irwin because of what a great guy that he is. And so is another one who hit a beautiful third shot from under that, what looks like a banyan tree, uh, Tom Watson, who led it to start of play today. So he's on in three. Now what Tom will, go, will do here, uh, Chris, he'll go ahead and finish out uh, no matter where he puts the ball because it's obvious that Hale is going to be the winner. Um, so don't be too surprised if he goes ahead and puts out. I'd like to see him make a putt for a change. Well, that's what kind of day it's been. 24-year-old Tom Watson. This tap in for a bogey five at the home hole. That will put him in at 12 over with a round of 79. And that's the story on Tom Watson. But we'll be back. I'm sure he's going to win a youngster. Look at that. He throws the ball to three youngsters who have been following him along. And Hale Irwin now taking plenty of time looking from beyond the hole here at 18. You know, Ed Schneider was the general chairman here of the tournament, the tournament manager, Nancy Jupp, the general manager, James Noletti, grounds committee, John Breckenridge and Wilson Barnes. How about the honorary chairman, Gus Benedict? Oh, yeah. Of course, Tom Curtin. What a program they had this oh. year. And Jack McDermott, as we see how it stands, on and two regulation. It's a par four, 18th hole. Hale Irwin, seven over, leading Forrest Fesler by two. What a nice, comfortable little situation. 
Well, you know he'd like to hit a good putt here. He can, of course, uh, you know, three putt and still win the tournament, but you don't want to do that. He's hit such a great shot in here. You would like to, as Arnold has done so many times in the past, he'd like to make a birdie and finish like a real champion. Mm hmm. We'll see in a second. As we indicated, he had birdied 9, 11, 14, and oh, ever so sweet. There it is, the United States Open champion. And there goes the ball. Like a forward pass for Colorado. I think somebody out there should have called for a fair catch. Uh, I hope we don't first aid. We've got to plug the volunteer nurses from the White Plains Hospital and Dr. Granson and his staff. There's Hale Owen. He won't need a doctor. He's just so happy. There's a the man that finished second for Forrest Pesler. And there it is. Good follow through. Lost his helmet. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be the happiest man in town right there. And deservedly so, Chris. 287 playing under these conditions is just terrific. The United States Open champion is Hale Irwin with a round of 73 7 over second Forrest Pesler. Tied for third, Lou Graham and Burt Yancey. We'll be back. All right, Hale Irwin, the 1974 United States Open champion, 29 years old from Boulder, Colorado, and today at a round of 73 to finish at seven over, winning it by two over Forrest Fesler, who is one of those that has qualified for next year's United States Open to be contested at number three course of Medina. There they are. And of course, most of those top 16 will be invited to the Masters at Augusta National. The United States Open, most important championship in golf. And there are still programs available of this Open, and for $3 by riding the winged foot, you can get a copy as a souvenir. About We're down here on the 72nd hole. On my left, Forrest Fesler, the man who almost did it today. And Hale Irwin, the man who did do it today. A couple of young men, 24 years of age for Mr. Fesler and 29 years of age for Mr. Irwin, who realized a dream, I guess, Hale. That's exactly right, Keith. I haven't uh, told anyone but my wife. Uh, about three weeks ago, I had a dream. I won the U.S. Open. Uh, and uh, it's just a dream come true. There was a fire burning in the eyes uh, last night when you went home because you were very positive in our conversation late yesterday afternoon. Well, I was trying to be as positive as I could. I felt good about today. Uh, I felt like it was a day to go out and try and eliminate the uh, mistakes and let the other guy make them. And everyone made them today. I made a lot. But uh, it's just that type of golf course. You just can't get away with uh, no mistakes. I had a feeling that when you saved par on seven coming out of the bunker today and then knocked in a tough putt that might have turned things around for you. Seven was a good hole. Uh, it looked like I was going to make a bogey, and I made a, a good uh, old 12 or 15 foot putt for par. And uh, as good as I felt, though, and then I missed that little five or six footer at eight. Uh, but actually, the putt at nine, that that long one, about 40 feet that went in. That that to me was uh, a very very big putt. You now will become one of the pursued rather than a pursuer in the legends of golf because your name goes alongside some of the greatest names in the history of it. Well, that's, that pleases me to no end. I, I, I'm just as happy as I can be, Keith. Our congratulations to you. I'm sure you'll be a great U.S. Open champion. Well, I, I'll certainly try. Uh, the men that have worn the U.S. Open crown before me have all been uh, extremely good uh, players and very fine gentlemen. I only hope I can duplicate that. I'm sure you will. And Forrest Fesler, the best to you. Your turn will come. Thank you, Keith. I hope so. So there are the two young men who provided the greatest drama of the day as Hale Irwin wins the 1974 U.S. Open Golf Championship here at Wingfoot in Mamaroneck, New York. Folks, would you please move behind the rope? Here again is Chris. All right, winning it by two shots, and the man that for two years was an all-big eight defensive safety at Colorado, winning two Heritage Classics, father of a two-year-old daughter, Becky. And uh, let's see one phase of where he clinched the victory. As we said, he had some birdies coming in and, of course, a big putt at the seventh hole for a three. Here is the par putt. And look at that. Earlier, 
and he made a couple of fine cuts and he was off his feet uh, with joy. But here he knew he was getting closer to the 72nd That's hole good, right? and it was a, a joyous calm, I guess you could call. That was at 17, you remember. And he needed that baby because there was only one more hole to play. As you look at scores of top players, Johnny Miller, the defending champion, at 22 over. Tom Weiskopf, who will be going to Royal Lytham and St. Anne's to defend his British Open Championship. Bruce Crampton, Hubert Green at 20. J.C. Sneed, and incidentally, his uncle Sam Sneed did qualify for this United States Open, but had to withdraw because of a cracked rib. And we hope Sam will give it a try again next year. Other 72-hole scores, Bruce Summerhays, Andy Bean, and... There you see one of the three amateurs that made the cut, Bill Heinlein. You see two of them right there, as a matter of fact, Andy Bean. The low amateur, incidentally, was Jay Haas, who had a 77 today, finished a 27 over, and he happens to be the nephew of professional Bob Goldie from Belleville, Illinois. We congratulate him. There you see the milling around the 18th green. Folks walking across it, which of course was not allowed other than the fact that you were a United States Open competitor. And you see some of the white and blue uniforms down there from the shot coming out of the, the blimp high overhead on. We're pretty much surprised, David Marr, that the weather stayed as it did. The forecasts were not for this type of uh, an afternoon. Well, I think we were very fortunate to get, really, it cleared up uh, quite a bit. It was a little windy and gusty playing, and that, I think, reflects itself in the scores. All right, as we mentioned, Jay Haas, the low amateur, this is one of his putts. He finished a 27 over. So this is uh, just a wonderful event for this young man, and as we say, the nephew of Bob Goldie. So he'll be in some other events during the next 12 months, David. 